Yes. Mr. Cameron. Present. Mr. Bowman. Here. Ms. Kelly is absent. Here. Mr. Here. Here. I pledge the allegiance. I pledge the allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, God indivisible, liberty and justice. justice for all. All right, welcome everybody. Um, first item is to read the or, uh, approval of the minutes of the last meeting. I'll entertain a motion. I would move to approve. Second. Is there a second? All right, uh, we'll call vote, please. <coughs> Mr. Cameron? Aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Beagle? Aye. Mr. Peterman? Aye. Mr. Slaughter? Aye. All right. This is a section of the meeting for visitors and communications. And the first on the list today is Scott uh, Sedmack and John Mitchell from St. Elizabeth Healthcare. So if you all would like to step forward and and turn the projector on in my face, that would be yeah. great. <laughs> That's what I understand. Yeah. So I might oh, yeah. shift a little bit. He's telling me it takes a second to warm up, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, my name is John Mitchell. I'm the uh, Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for St. Elizabeth uh, Fort Thomas mm -hmm. location. I'm also at our Covington location. Um, I'm new to Fort Thomas. I've only been in this role about nine to ten months, but I'm not new to St. Elizabeth. I've been with St. E for 15 years now, so, um, and uh, I appreciate you giving us a few minutes on the agenda. I am here tonight to talk to you a little bit about uh, our past year in review and talk to you about some exciting things that are going on at St. Elizabeth, just so the council is in the know. So, um, we are um, a major player in Northern Kentucky from a healthcare standpoint. And uh, in 2017, we had uh, 4,500 births in Northern Kentucky, more than uh, 34,000 different surgeries. We had uh, 1.4 <coughs> million outpatient visits, over uh, 55,000 inpatient admissions, and uh, overall about 3 million patient encounters across our organization. So St. E is the largest employer in Northern Kentucky with 8,500 associates. More than 80% of our associates live in, and physicians live in Northern Kentucky. St. Elizabeth employs more than 1,300 residents of Campbell County and employs more than 1,000 employees at, at in, I'm sorry, I said that wrong, 1,300 residents of Campbell County and employs about 1,000 employees in Campbell County. And 227 of our employees are residents of the city of Fort Thomas. Total economic impact of more than $2 billion Saney has contributed roughly $80 million in combined local and state taxes, including sales tax, city tax, and payroll tax. And that means we are about 10% of the economy of Northern Kentucky. Uh, community benefit is a big part of St. Elizabeth. We are a nonprofit and uh, we, we have uh, a mission uh, vision and so, uh, uh, about a hundred million dollars in community benefit in 2017 and uh, that was made up of Medicare losses, unpaid costs including Medicaid and indigent care, free and discounted health services and uncompensated care. And we are also tr uh, striving to be a, a, the best community partner and we're doing things uh, in the area of health and wellness, uh, our response to the opioid epidemic. We partner with healthcare institutions like the YMCA and Griffin Sports. Uh, we're working in the education arena. We, we are partnering with the University, uh, uh, Northern Kentucky University to build their uh, Health Innovation Center. We're also working with NKU and UK to b bring a medical school to Northern Kentucky. And we're also working in the area of workforce development, working with startup companies through Uptech and Centrifuge and supporting the Navigo program, which um, partners high school students with employers. 
So uh, one of the visions of, Northern, of uh, St. Elizabeth is to make Northern Kentucky one of the healthiest communities in America. Uh, it's a very lofty goal, and uh, currently our, our uh, measure of that is uh, citizens that self-report a health status of either excellent or very good. Right now, 49% of the citizens of Northern Kentucky report excellent or very good. We want to get them to 55%. Um, and one of the biggest, some of the biggest challenges that we have to face are uh, smoking, smoking cessation. Uh, we have a big problem with cancer in this region, uh, substance abuse disorder, which we'll talk about a little bit, and diabetes. We also are partnering with other uh, community organizations. For example, Go Pantry, St. Elizabeth uh, Associates were, uh, provided 1,112 boxes of full meals for students so they would not go hungry over the summer months. Uh, we announced a partnership with the Northern Kentucky Build uh, Coalition and um, that is to reduce tobacco use in Covington and Gallatin County. And we also are a big participant with the American Heart Association in both their Heart Race and Heart Chase. And uh, more than 700 St. Elizabeth Associates and their family members and friends have helped to build three Habitat for Humanity homes, two in Northern Kentucky and one in Indiana. We also provide sports medicine and athletic training services to 22 high schools, three club sports programs, and to two universities. And we do so at no cost to the schools. And that is the equivalent of 40 FTEs and the team physicians that we provide. And that, that translates to about $2.5 million in community benefit. Uh, just talking about some of the awards that St. Elizabeth has received recently, our, uh, our radiology division received the Diagnostic Imaging Center of Excellence Award. Uh, our hospice received honors elite status for patient satisfaction mm -hmm. scores. Uh, the Fort Thomas Hospital uh, received the American Heart Association, the American Stroke Associations, Get With the Guidelines Arterial Fib Gold Award. Fort Thomas was also recognized by the AHA for heart failure on a roll. Uh, we are the second highest enrolling institution behind MD Anderson on the alternative approach study for breast cancer. Uh, Fort Thomas Hospital was recognized by Health Grades with the two, uh, 2018 Patient Safety Excellence Award given to only the top 10% of hospitals in the country. And our biggest achievement, the one I'm most proud of, Fort Thomas recently became a magnet designated hospital. It's uh, something that we've been working on for the past eight to 10 years. Uh, Edgewood, Covington, and Grant have been magnet for 12 years, and we have been trying to get Florence and Fort Thomas to achieve magnet status uh, since the merger, and we just achieved that in uh, earlier this year in the spring. Uh, St. Elizabeth Physicians is a big component of our organization, and they are the highest rated physicians in the region, uh, 4.7 on a 5-point scale. Um, and uh, they lead the region for the MyChart usage and other innovative access tools such as online scheduling and e-visits. Uh, innovation, uh, St. Elizabeth and our orthopedics department performed the first total knee replacement surgery using a, a Mako robotic assisted surgery uh, robot. Uh, we were the first in the world to offer a revolutionary new shoulder replacement surgery. Uh, it's a rotator cuff sparing method. We were the first in the region to offer the upgraded Maser X technology for spinal fusion. Uh, uh, Fort Thomas also is, uh, has a uh, state-of-the-art uh, long-term IV therapy unit. And we were the first in the country to implement EPIC, our electronic medical record vendor, uh, EPIC's acuity system. So talking about building for the future, growth is happening. We, as I mentioned, we've announced our affiliation with the University of Kentucky and Northern Kentucky to develop a UK regional medical school campus right here in Northern Kentucky. We're ramping up our precision medicine capabilities. That's uh, genetic testing to uh, to actually target medical care 
for uh, cardiac as well as cancer. Well, we finished our master facility plan, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that in a few minutes. Um, we have a uh, comprehensive oncology strategic plan, including a new cancer facility, which I'll mention in just a moment. And we've invested a significant amount of marketing dollars and uh, developing a customer relationship management system. So Comprehensive Cancer Center, we announced our, our major commitment to, uh, to building a $120 million cancer center on our Edgewood campus. Well, we launched our 10th St. Elizabeth Foundation Vision Campaign to raise funds for uh, the building of this facility. $1.5 million was pledged by our associates and providers with over 70% participation and uh, the foundation will now be uh, beginning their external campaign to raise funds for this new facility. Other projects that will expand access, we have partnerships with Sun Behavioral Health in Erlanger. We have, we have a regional lab in a partnership with TriHealth. And uh, we've developed a new sports medicine location at the Griffin Elite and a uh, partnership with OrthoCincy. At Edgewood, we've installed a new linear accelerator. We've expanded the Cincinnati Eye Institute facility. We've, uh, we've added a thoracic OR PICU. Grant County, we've expanded their ED and, and did some renovation to the main entrance. SEP, we've opened a multi-specialty building in Dearborn, Indiana. And we've opened a journey to recovery for um, drug and alcohol addiction uh, right there in, uh, in Crestview Hills. Florence, we've re re reno renovated and moved our physical therapy. And in Owen County, we are providing outpatient services and after hours care. So another area of growth is our business health, where we're developing relationships with businesses. We have over 20 new company contracts in 2017. We're currently operating five on-site clinics. We have uh, contracts with DHL and Amazon, and uh, we've added on-site primary care at New Core Steel down in De Gallatin County. And uh, we are currently uh, working with the Northern Kentucky Chamber to market a health care plan called the Elite Health Care Plan that will be sold to Northern Kentucky businesses. When it comes to fighting heroin, in 2017, we had over 3,200 visits to our EDs that were opioid related. That's about 1.6% of our total ED volume. And Saney has invested over $3.3 million in addiction related services, including dedicated resources, uh, partnering with the next heroin impact community plan for Northern Kentucky, We've doubled our addiction treatment capacity. Uh, we've advocated for syringe access, and I'll mention a little bit about that in just a moment. Uh, we've partnered with the Inquirer to raise awareness, and actually, uh, because of our partnership, the Inquirer won a Pulitzer Prize Award uh, with their reporting, and uh, we provided opioid 101 training for nurses. So syringe access is uh, something that's going to be operated by the Northern Kentucky Health Department in, in the next week in both our Covington and Newport locations. So the Newport location is at our Saney Physician Urgent Care parking lot at 1400 North Grand. Uh, the open house is tomorrow uh, from uh, I think one to three and uh, regular hours will be Tuesdays from one to four starting July 24th. We also will have uh, an operation in Covington on Thursdays from one to four, um, starting that same week. So talking a little bit about Fort Thomas and the impact that we have in Campbell County, we've invested a significant amount of money in the facility over the last few years. We purchased the Mildred Dean site. We built our uh, medical office building on that campus. We've uh, invested extensively in uh, IT equipment and our EPIC implementation. We've expanded and remodeled our oncology clinic at the Fort Thomas location. We've uh, expanded and updated our women's wellness suite. We've added a new endoscopy suite and we've up upgraded our uh, ICU. We've also improved our outpatient radiology suite right next to our ER. We've uh, updated the main street or our main entrance area. We've 
added the Da Vinci robot and uh, we actually just purchased the newest, latest and greatest model of Da Vinci. It's called the XI robot and uh, we'll be rolling that out in August. Um, we did remodel our emergency department and we did some upgrades to our ORs and uh, that was over $34 million already and we've got another $15 million to spend over the next two years. So. Um, our, our, our overall strategy for Campbell County is, uh, you know, we're here to serve as community hospital. Our focus is for short stays and, and surgical uh, volume. The, um, the services that we offer currently are cancer care, robotic and general surgery, emergency services, skilled nursing, wound care, urology, urogyne services, women's services. And uh, for inpatient, short stay, uh, podiatry, uro, urogen, and uh, urology, and for outpatient services, cancer, uh, heart and vascular, ortho, and women's. And uh, as I mentioned, we, we were approved in our master facility plan, and Fort Thomas was allocated about $15 million. And what we're going to do with that money is uh, we are actually, which is not on the slide, we're installing a new linear accelerator in our cancer care unit. Uh, we, are, we are spending uh, about $10 million uh, completely gutting and renovating our ORs. Our ORs haven't been touched in over 20 years, so we're bringing those up to uh, state-of-the-art uh, capacity. Um, we are looking uh, for, uh, uh, we're not looking for land, we have land in front of NKU uh, on US 27 where we're going to be building a multi-specialty clinic and urgent care right there in Highland Heights and we are also going to be expanding the MOB right here in Newport um, at the 1400 Grand location. So that is the end of my slides and I'd be happy to entertain any questions that you might have for me and I also want to give a shout out to Scott Sedmack who's with me. He's our director of community relations and he helped me put together the slide and he can help me answer questions as well. Excellent. That's very interesting. I didn't realize how many, how many things you all were involved with here in, in Fort Thomas and in Northern Kentucky in general. Uh, very interesting. Very good stuff. Um, anybody have any questions or comments? Or? Uh, John has said a quick question. Is anything the city can do to help support St. Pete in your mission? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, being there for us when we need you from a legislative standpoint or um, any, any kind of hurdles that we might hit from uh, either county or state, um, if we, we could count on your support. Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that's uh, that's uh, <coughs> preventing us from moving forward. But if if it were there, um, part of why we come out and we talk is we want people to be aware of all the good things that Saney is doing and the uh, major impact that we do have on the community. And uh, we do want to be a, a good community partner. So um, we appreciate the time. I like the wellness focus and also the bands or things you have out to do the screenings and th to make it easy for people to find out, you know, right. is there a problem or am I good? You know, Fort Thomas is such an active community. People are walking all the time in our visioning process that we've, in the process of doing, there's, you know, we've got, we've got um, trails through the parks. We've got, folks are really interested in being able to, this is a very walkable town. Right, right. And uh, I'm serious when I say that one of our, our goals is to make Northern Kentucky one of the healthiest communities. And we are more than happy to partner with communities on things like walking trails, bike trails, playgrounds, anything that promotes a healthy lifestyle. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, John Scott, I appreciate you uh, reaching out to a community like this. I, this isn't something I don't think that St. Elizabeth has done historically, and I don't think a lot of folks in the community are aware of, of um, you know, how top-notch the services are that St. Elizabeth uh, provides. You know, Fort Thomas is rated as one of the top places to live in the country uh, by some survey, and and one of the key factors is access to health care, and so you know, your uh, city is a critical 
corporate citizen, and it's, it, I think it's also great that there's a big audience tonight. They're actually, <clears throat> don't want to disappoint you, they probably didn't not come to me. hear I you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nevertheless, um, you know, health is um, an individual and community responsibility too. So the fact that people are aware of this and, and the fact that St. Elizabeth, St. Elizabeth is, is promoting healthy lifestyles as a matter as a means of having a healthy, healthier community, asking communities to participate in this health endeavor, I think is is important. So thank you for coming. Thank you. I appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. All right. <clears throat> okay, we are still in the visitors and communications sections, and I realize <clears throat> a lot of you are probably here about the zoning text amendment. Before we get, and I will move that up on the agenda so you all, so we can get to that sooner. But prior to that, is there anybody here that wants to address council on something other than the uh, text amendment issue? Good evening, Mayor Haas and council. I would like to address the council about that, but there are several other things I wanted to bring to your attention. Excuse I am me. Mary Healy. Thank you. <laughs> and I live at 110 Hollywoods Drive. Okay. You may recall that I was here in May mm -hmm. and expressed concern that the South End was, did not seem to be um, at the forefront of City Council's um, agenda. Mm -hmm. I want to mention two other things as an example, uh, and what I learned actually at the, after the meeting. On the way out, I was talking to uh, Roger Peterman, and I, I had mentioned during the meeting about the benches, that mm -hmm. there are beautiful benches <coughs> and that we don't have any in the South End. Roger mentioned to me he thought that I could buy one for $500. I learned after that that because City Council hasn't extended the discount to certain areas of town, if I want to buy a bench in memory of my parents who lived on Hollywood Drive, I have to pay $1,000 instead of $500. And I think that's entirely unfair when we seem to have more benches than what we need in the City Business District and now the uh, Midway, and I have to pay $500 more. That's one example. I also, living on the South End, I don't take Memorial Parkway very often to town. But I did because I do support the banks here and had to stop at the bank on the way home last Friday. I noticed that the Gateway um, Fort Thomas signs were very nicely landscaped across from Starboard uh, Dust Point where you happen to live. I invite City Council to take a drive in the South Corridor. We do not have landscaping on our Gateway sign. We have weeds growing under it right now. So those are just two examples where I, I assume that it is a uh, lack of attention and not that we are being discriminated against. But they are very visible signs that the South End needs to receive more attention and fairness from this council. And um, I don't know if you have any questions, but I wanted to bring those things to your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Could, should I sure. update council on both of those <coughs> items? And, and forgive me, I'm not certain the confusion, the sponsoring of benches is the same throughout the city and that rate has never changed. So I was told by Melissa when I called her about it that there is a $500 price for in the Central Business District and the Midway and that I would have to pay $1,000. Did a you not tell me that, a Melissa? A streetscape bench is cheaper because it's part of a project if it's not already designated, but they're all designated because they're about $525 now. If we extend that streetscape out, then I would assume. What the, if, if they're streetscape, it's any part of the streetscape, but our park benches are $1,000, right? Mm -hmm. Well, is a, is a bench at the top of Hollywood's Drive where there are two different bus routes that go through Fort Thomas. If it's Thomas. a streetscape, then it would be the same. So we can, we can address okay. that issue. Well, and on the other issue on the signs, the signs were sponsored by Renaissance and they will all be landscaped. The only one that's landscaped to date is the one, and we had a volunteer do the design, but every one of them will be landscaped. Well, so, it's just a so matter of one, timing, too. <coughs> I'm just I, pointing this out that the south side is a part of Fort Thomas, and I heard it's one of the top places to live, as mentioned by Mr. Peterman tonight. I don't think if people only saw the south side that we may get that ranking, and I think that needs to change. Fair enough. And again, I'm just saying that all of, all the signs will be landscaped. Thank you. All right. Would anybody else like to address council on something other than the text amendment? Sure. 
Are we able to address the same folks? Sure. Sorry, guys. I didn't know I was going to do this. I'm a little nervous. State <laughs> um, your name and address for the record, please. Okay. Uh, Brian Schultz. I live on Summit, 81 Summit. Okay. Thank you for letting me talk. I'll make this brief. Uh, everything that the guys from St. E said is true. I've worked at hospitals for a long, long time. I actually used to work at there a long time ago. Uh, it's great for our community. It's great to have a hospital in our community. I think it's fantastic. I'm an ER nurse. So um, it's fantastic to have this syringe exchange thing is something that we need. I don't work at St. E. I don't work right here on the hill, but I live here. And um, I'm with fire and police. These guys can probably appreciate what I see two days ago, every day that I'm there. The, I worked two days ago. I, I pulled two people that were not alive. We put them out of the car and we made them alive again. And it's over and over and over. This is a terrible epidemic that's going on. Uh, probably my only question is um, this: the, the needle exchange will probably be some kind of van, some kind of some kind of apparatus that the decision as to why it's being put right there by the hospital just because where is is it a need for is that where the most amount of people are that it that these people where the overdoses are it feels like you know it should be taken to where the amount of overdoses are taking place you know it seems like it should, if this, this is a large amount of overdoses in one area maybe that should be a traveling it, it um it, well, you know, maybe yeah. I, I'll, let me respond to that. I've uh, <laughs> been um, pretty involved in that, and that's a political question. Under Kentucky law, you have to have the approval of both yeah. if the location is in the city. You have to have the approval of both the county government and the city government to have a needle exchange facility, operation, mobile unit, whatever it happens to right. be. Um, it's been a very difficult thing to achieve. In fact, this location actually is at the uh, physician's office building, which is in Newport, not in Fort Thomas. Well, oh, yeah, and I understand. And, and <coughs> it would probably take an hour and a half to go through everything that's happened to finally get to the point that one of these can be anywhere sure. in Campbell County and, and also one in Kenton County. There's not one in Boone County. Couldn't get that done. Um, so, you know, without going through, you know, a lot of detail on that, again, which would take a lot, you know, just, you know, I think the short answer is politically very, very, very difficult to achieve. Finally got something done in, you know, maybe the only place it could get done, not even in the best way to do it. A lot of flaws in it, but it's a place and it's a start. And I understand that. I just this is just coming from I'm just a guy who's a nurse, been kind of worse than you are, but yeah, these are my patients every day, yeah. and I just hope that there aren't you know you bring that and you bring people that are involved in that with it. Just you know, again, this is our community, and I just hope it doesn't or you know. I'd like to add something. Roger already touched on it. It, it's not in Fort Thomas. That we didn't vote to bring it here. No, no, and yeah. I know that. I just don't know where else. It's <laughs> placed on the outskirts of Newport, almost in Fort Thomas, close enough to Fort Thomas that it will affect. It sure could potentially affect us. Uh, but it's you know I just want to reiterate the fact that we did not. Oh no, no, yeah, here. I'm just I only I only came up because the, the guys from St. E. Yeah. We're, we're we're up here. Yeah. Oh no, yeah, I just I can turn around. Fort Thomas had no say in this because it's a matter of feet from the actual city line of Fort Thomas. It's not in Fort Thomas. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, I, and, and I, I understand. I'm sorry, Ms. White, and I just talk over him all the time. Um, <laughs> but uh, so going back to your point, that it's an hour and a half uh, explanation. So, but at the end of the day, barring, I, I'd be happy to read any minutes that you would like to share with us. Um, I still don't understand why there. Your answer, while I think you may have thought it was an answer, was a non-answer. So if this opioid epidemic, which I work in healthcare too, I see it, I, I, I get it. Um, but it doesn't seem like that would be the most logical location. And while I think what you're trying to say is that at least we got one somewhere, that that is the answer to that question, 
but that does not seem like where the crowd of folks that maybe would need that service would be. Now, I'm not naive. I don't walk around like my Aunt Mary, like everything's wonderful in life, but I know that there are issues out there. We have an issue with someone in my neighborhood, and I get that, but it doesn't seem like that is the most viable place for that. So, and leading up to what else we're going to talk about tonight, storage units. So we have a limited number of access ways into our city. So at one, we're going to have a needle exchange. At one, we're going to potentially have a giant, ugly storage building. Um, and in my mind, that is not why I moved here and paid twice what my house is worth to move here from Kenton County and put my child in the school district. I, and, and again, I, I'm very fortunate that I've not been heavily impacted aside from him with the opioid epidemic, not that he uses them, but he has to see it every day. And then I'm lucky enough to hear about all the dead people when he comes home. Um, but it doesn't seem like that is within what the vision and what the sales pitch of Fort Thomas is. So, and yes, I know it's on the edge, it's technically a new part, I get it, I get it. But I'm still proceeding down that road directly into Fort Thomas. It's a matter of steps for us. And I'm just curious why there. Um, it, it is not where I believe and where I think the general public believes is the greatest need. Um, I'm questioning the ability to impact folks so far out of um, maybe the target area. So, I'm so the answer is, I mean, it really is what I said. You could probably pick the area where you think it would be the best. And I can tell you, politically, it would never be approved. It hasn't been. They tried. Couldn't get it approved. And I realize that is a very simple question that does not have a very simple answer. Right. I, that makes absolutely no sense. First of all, I want to, one thing that needs to be clear is this doesn't really have to do with the addictive nature of, of the opioid problem really has to do with the spread of HIV and hepatitis C. Oh, and that's, that's the, the cause of well and, and I know that the audience may not be aware of that. So um, you know infected needles spread these I mean probably people are worse not far from us of so the county in Indiana that had this massive outbreak of HIV and hepatitis C because of dirty needles. That's the intent of that program is to stop the spread of that disease which in particular in the case of hepatitis can be transmitted by other methods so the more people that have hepatitis C it puts everybody at risk so there's some certainly some value in doing that now you know the best place to put it I, I mean I, I, I don't know that would be speculation it's not where the health department and other health care providers wanted it to be it's not being done in the way they want it to be but it's the best they could get and you just compromise on things I'm sure there's all kinds of things in your life that aren't the best, but they're 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 what you could do. So, you know, it's it's just one of those things. All right. Thank you for your comments. Anybody else like to address council on any other issue? All right. Um, we're going to move the agenda, to, um, move the ordinances on the text amendment on the self storage facilities up to now on the agenda, if you don't mind since I think that's what most people are here. And Jan, if you would give us an update on the procedure sure. I mean, and how we're supposed to go about this. Um, my name is Jan Seidenfey and I'm the attorney for the city. Um, and I also work with the Planning Commission here. Um, there has been a lot of confusion about text amendments and zone changes. So what I'd like to do is to, uh, to try to explain briefly the difference and what we are dealing with uh, tonight in our next meeting and what we're not dealing with so that you can distinguish the two. Um, and, and it is an important distinction. The city of Fort Thomas has a zoning ordinance and um, it's this booklet, it's about this thick, and it talks about zoning classifications, what can be built in what zones, uh, landscaping, lighting, parking, um, development, definitions, it's verbiage, it's words, it's a text. That's what we are talking about, uh, or what, what the hearing was about. It was about a text amendment, which is wording in the zoning ordinance. Um, the text amendment dealt with adding a definition of what the self-storage facility is, and it also dealt with 
adding the self-storage facility as a permitted use in a general commercial zone. Okay, that's what is under discussion. Okay? What is not under discussion is a zone change. In addition to this text, we also have a map, and the map has everybody's property and what zone you're in, whether you're in a residential zone or a commercial zone or a highway commercial zone or an industrial zone. So this is a map. That's the zoning part of this is not a map amendment of anybody's real estate. So we're not taking any parcel of real estate and changing it from one designation to another. So for example, if it was a residential zone, it's not being changed to any other zone. So it's not a zone change that we're talking about. It's only a text <coughs> amendment. Now, um, and this is the part where I won't be popular, but I'll tell you how it works. Um, the way the Kentucky Revised Statute outlines this procedure, we obviously have to adhere to that. It's the law. The requirement is that the Planning Commission publish that we're going to have a hearing on the text amendment. And there was a publication, there were notices, and on June 20th, we were here for two hours plus, and the Planning Commission, not City Council, the Planning Commission, took evidence and information and testimony. They received a letter in as an exhibit. They received a petition signed by um, some property owners. So anybody who wanted to come, any one of you, could have come on June 20th and you could have addressed the Planning Commission with the reasons you're either for it or you're against it. At the conclusion of that hearing on June 20th, that is our record and the record ends there. We cannot accept any more comments or emails or phone calls or letters because that is the record that the city council now reviews and makes a decision as to whether they will follow the recommendation of the planning commission or whether they won't follow the recommendation. So they have to, you have to limit somehow what is it that they're going to be reviewing. And so the Kentucky statute said, this is what you're going to review. You're going to review the transcript and the evidence that was taken on June 20th. You are not in a position to go out and talk to all your friends or uh, elicit comments or receive your phone calls or your emails or even your comments tonight. Those things are, cannot be introduced into a record and they cannot influence the council members. The council members have a definite limitation. So I'm sure quite a few of you wanted to come and to address council tonight and tell them how you felt about things. That opportunity was on June 20th and it doesn't exist tonight. So no one, and if any council member sees you and you try to talk to them or if you send them a letter and they don't respond to it or you send them an email and they don't open it, it's not because they're being rude or inconsiderate or that they've already made up their minds. It's that they know they have an obligation to limit their review to what was put on that record on June 20th. Um, I know, I, I've heard that some people have tried to contact council members, sent letters, sent emails. They cannot open those, they can't review them, and they can't entertain that information. So, now I want to also, though, make a comment about a zone change. If a zone change occurs, if somebody asks for a zone change on any property, it's a similar procedure in terms of, again, there would be a hearing at a planning commission level. That's your opportunity to come and give your input. Okay, so I would just suggest if you're interested in the planning commission and the process, there is a difference between text amendment and zoning map amendment. We are not changing anybody's zoning on their land tonight, um, and we're actually not doing any text tonight. It's just a first reading of an ordinance, and then the next meeting there would be a second reading of the ordinance, and then there would be a vote at that time. Yes, sir? I have a question then. So okay. if I live in a residential area, and I want, I, and I wanted to approach you all for a text amendment so that I could put up a gas station on my residential property, let's just call it a text amendment, and we can proceed on that, uh, on that basis. Well, first of all, Essentially, you, you, that's you, what we're doing here, right? This property, this property was not Okay, we're not going to talk about this case. I'll, I'll just answer your question, but we're not going to get into these specifics. Okay, if you wanted, if, wait a second, can I finish this answer, please? 
if you wanted to have any kind of a text amendment, you go to the Planning Commission and you tell them what your request mm -hmm. is. But you have to, un when you say you want a gas station on a residential property, a gas station is not a permitted use on a residential property, so you can't do that. As not as a storage facility in terms of We're not going to talk about this case. Okay. What if you feel like the city didn't properly advertise for this tax amendment? Personally, I do not get the Campbell County report. And if it had not been for Fort Thomas Living, um, I live in the crossings of Fort Thomas, which is going to abut this property. Okay, we're not going to talk uh, about this. I know this. we're not, but you have to listen to what I'm saying. Well, you're talking about advertising, and, um, you know, we're it's advertised. About the project. No, but it's there was nothing posted. And when I talked to the city, they said you don't have to post. Uh, because it involved so many different areas of the city. So when it comes for the zoning change, it'll be posted. But we had no idea, and so the board at the crossings of Fort Thomas met with Mr. Heil. Okay, we're not going to talk about this case. I know, but you got to hear this. No, we no, to. no, I'm sorry. We, this is not part you of all this. You need to hear this. Okay, why don't you do that after this well, issue? Who are we supposed to talk to? Well, what I'm saying is, after this issue is resolved, and a vote is taken, say, after next month's meeting, come back and say, can you improve your communication? Can you get the word out on zone changes or text amendments? But we're not going to talk about the specifics of this case. Even though we were told that there was no vote that would be taken at that meeting. So I, we I can't address Mr. Heil, there would be Okay, again, no again, you are but giving uh, information that should not be given at this time. I'm Mary Healy. I live at 110 Hollywoods Drive, and I'm not going to talk about this case. I'm going to talk about the U-Haul that is adjacent to what was owned by Mr. Heil as to his character. And it has, it has to do with, not this case, I um, just want to make sure that the City Council is aware of this. Um, I was not at that meeting, I was at the out of the country where there was a hearing, but I heard about it. I want to ask Juan Deal. I understand that Mr. Heil said that he cut grass, um, contrary to what my photograph showed that he cut grass before Memorial Day. Excuse me, now is this something he said in the hearing? Then we're back to the hearing again and we can't talk about that. Well, I'm talking about um, the U-Haul facility. So I, I will ask Ron Dill that last spring a year ago, I had a converse phone conversation with you about the U-Haul facility. You told me that you had spoken to Mr. Heil about the maintenance and improvements of it. You told me he told you that he was going to do landscaping, he was going to do some um, repaving, and he was going to do something to camouflage the unsightly vehicles that were there. You told me that he said he would do that when the weather broke. I had a conversation with you then later last year, a year ago in the summer, and you said he reneged on that. And you said he wasn't legally obligated to do that. Do you remember those conversations, Mr. Not Newton? specifically in that text, no. Gee, that's very but interesting. No, it's not. That. Please let me answer the okay. question. You, you have repeated multiple times that we've had multiple conversations, and I don't recall that we've had multiple conversations. You've had multiple conversations with people in our office, but not specifically me. I had You're two crediting conversations me with, with conversations you. that I don't recall specifically, okay. but with regard to the issue of screening, first of all, I was not engaged in, in, in uh, the process when it went through planning and zoning with the owners of that property. I don't know who owns that property specifically. I did share with you that I had conversations with Mr. Heil who indicated that he had intentions of doing additional screening. Okay? okay. And, 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 and that's and, true. And to your knowledge, has he not? Correct, he okay. has not. To, I also today. understand that Mr. Heil, and I even heard Mr. Peterman repeat this at a May meeting, that he has let this council know, and maybe the council is aware without him knowing, that he purports to pay a lot of taxes to the city. <coughs> I would like to clarify that he, the taxes that he remits to the city, I assume the major amount of the taxes, are um, taxes he collects from his employees for employment tax. So the taxes do not come out of his pocket. And I would like the city to be reminded of that. 
There are also one thing that I, I wanted to ask about the um, vision uh, program that is going on with the city. I, I've served on that uh, zoning and planning committee. It appears to me that the city has invested a lot of money into that zoning and planning committee. I don't know if the uh, council can share with me how much it has paid, but I assume it's ongoing. We have a person that shows up at that committee me uh, meeting that comes from Columbus, and I assume it's not cheap for her to attend those meetings, and I assume she devotes other times. I want to make sure that this council is aware that out of that zoning committee, there were a number of businesses that that committee um, uh, thought that there was a need in for Thomas Four, and I invite you to look at that study because nothing was mentioned about um, a proposal to the zoning change about that. Also, the Parks and Recreation Committee, which Mayor Hoss, you mentioned to me uh, in the May meeting how much was going to be done for the South Corridor. And I just remind the council to keep that in mind, that uh, what the vision is that for, by both the Zoning Committee and the Parks and Recreation, and I don't think it envisions certain types of businesses that um, uh, certain people would like uh, considered. Lastly, I want to mention that I heard the Pledge to Allegiance tonight, and it said injustice for all. And uh, Mayor Hoss, I don't know if you're aware, and I don't know that anyone cares, but I do. I grew up in St. John's Church. I was four years ahead of you. You may not remember me, but your grandfather, Dr. Barkow, baptized and confirmed me. The first um, Bible verse that I uh, learned was Luke 10, 27, and it's treat your neighbors as yourself. And I would like all of the council to remember these things when it considers any change to this city that would uh, have a long-ranging effect on this city. So I think I have said things that do not affect directly tonight, but I want to make certain that council is aware of, not only tonight, but in the future when it considers any changes, any zoning changes whatsoever which are proposed. And to please remember that the South End is a part of the city, and we want to contribute to the city maintaining its top place and not be a deterrent to it. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. You, you know, one thing that, one thing that uh, there, there was a joint meeting uh, with all the committees, and they all made their presentations. And I, I don't know, Mary, if you're aware of this, but one of the most exciting things I came away with from that, because I wasn't aware of it myself, was, and Ron, you're going to have to help me with the terminology, there's this joint grant that all the cities along the US 27 corridor are applying for to redevelop all the way from the river out to NKU. And, you know, joint effort, they're, you know, making grant money and so forth available. Uh, you know, very high potential. So, you know, that's obviously, uh, US 27 goes through the south part of the city, that's what you're talking about. That's that, what that I'm may talking be something you want to get involved with. We, I mean, I don't know that the grant is. I don't. I, I don't remember. It's actually. The name of it. It's a smart city initiative, smart and city. actually, St. E's is a partner in that group. Well, that's right. So that's what I want to make sure. I. I don't know if I can say this, but I'm going to say this. I don't know how the planning committee is selected. I don't know how often they're changed, but I do think that that planning committee was not aware of possibly the parks and recreation desire for the South End. And that's why I also know that Mr. Peterman <coughs> told me at the last meeting um, that it's very rare for City Council to vote contrary to the um, recommendations. But I think this is an instance where the con uh, Council okay, really needs to... Okay, we're going to into a specific case <laughs> okay. again. <laughs> I would hope I that the City Council, the buck stops there, and I hope you always second guess what has been Thank proposed you. to you. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So, Jan, do you have a... Where are we at this point? This is I think you have counting. one more comment. Okay. Um, yeah. I just have a question for you. I tried to listen carefully to how you set up the context here tonight, and I want to make sure I was clear on what the procedure was. And actually, I'm Martha Kaufman. I live on Hawthorne Avenue. And um, I was wondering, like, how people were notified that there was going to be the, the planning and zoning hearing. Was it mailed? Was it posted? I wasn't sure how that took place. 
I believe it was. Well, by statute, you're required to advertise, advertise and, and, and the publication of record is the recorder, and that's we don't have any control over that. That's where we're required to advertise it. But with due respect, how many people go to the recorder and say, oh, let me see what the city of Fort Thomas is getting ready to do? I mean, people don't do that. Well, I understand that. I'm just saying that's our but that's required the, publication. That's under I mean, Kentucky that's what Revised Statute. That's, 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 that's what we have to do. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely uh, in there. I, I don't know. The Planning yes. Commission, as well as the Board of Adjustments for this city, and things were always posted. So that you could see around your neighborhood what was going on. That did not happen. When when it's specific to a site, then then it, and the petition is for a specific site, then it's placed at that location. Okay. It's required by law to do that. And no, yes, the recorder, the, the recorder is the the publication of record, and every city in the county has all of their information regarding their public well, meetings in that paper. Had it not been for Fort yeah. I know there's been and, there's been an attempt in Frankfurt for years, and I don't know if it's passed yet, to try to change that so that we can use other methods of notification instead of a, the paper. The recorder, a lot of the papers are still in business just because cities by law have to give notice in those papers. And that's my point. But, How would we know? Yeah. Gee, I, maybe it's time that we look at the recorder and see what's going on. I mean, that just doesn't happen. Can we do more? I, and I understand. And, and, and to answer your question a little further, Laura, if I could, the, when you have a specific property, that same statute dictates how you make individual notifications. But when it doesn't affect an individual property, the, the city has no way other than sending a letter to every single resident because we would never know who would be interested. We would never know who all was interested. We post it generically, generally, as we're required to and as we can. Um, but this is not a neighborhood. You see, we keep going back to thinking this is a neighborhood. This no, is a I text amendment this. for the entire city. Hi, I'm, I'm There's Tom like Morrison. five locations that can be involved in this. That's my understanding. I'm Inverness Tom. and uh, Okay, Hiles let's not get into can this specific. Can I talk about the, the, the general concept? Sure. I hear the truth. Sure. I, I'm okay. hearing Tom Morrison, 96 offer. I'm hearing that there is a legal obligation to post the notice in the Cambridge County Report. Fine. Is there a legal limitation on other mechanisms? Could you provide a, a system on your website that people can sign up and be on an email distribution and know what the next docket is for the specific plan? You know, I was going to ask. I was going to ask that question. Is I'm an attorney, and part of my responsibility is dealing with legal publications. In fact, I can tell you, I drafted a bill to change it. Yeah. This session, of the General Assembly didn't get changed. And so my question was going to be, well, what, what do you think would be adequate? And one of the ideas was to put it on the Internet. Now, to me, that has two values. Uh, one, uh, it, 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 it's efficient, an efficient way to get the information out to everybody if, if they're going to look at it. But it also um, um, promotes engagement. I mean, we want people engaged. You know, this, the city is always going to run better. Any organization is going to run, any, com any community is going to run better the more input that you can get to make decisions. And so, and, and so, but people actually would have to go to the site to do it. So, so I don't know. I mean, that's a general assembly question. They cr create those laws that we have to follow. But so, so the question is, does the law say that there's a Well, limitation? we could put it on a website. Does the law say there's a limitation that you can only do it these ways? Yeah, no. I mean, we, we can do more than the minimum. Yeah, you can do more than the minimum. Sure. Exactly. You could put it on the website. So you'd go to the website. Yes. So so but, I'm asking you to consider sure. alternate methods that are still within the law, may not be required, but yeah. are more likely to reach more people because clearly, as we've seen in specific cases that I will not mention, <laughs> it has not gone off very well. Thank you. No, but I will say this about websites, too, is that then there's personal responsibility, too, because then you have to go and look for it. Sure. So, you know, sure. and, 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 and I'm not saying that, you know, to be critical or anything. That's just, you know, sort of the way things... And I think it would be great if people would do that, and if, if that would be done, yeah. Um, my name is Elizabeth Ailing, and I live at Elizabeth Alexander Pike. And in addition to Tom's statements, it, there's no easy way to find any notifications from the city government. I've had to film the meetings before, and I've looked for schedules for just this basic city council meetings, and it's very difficult to navigate the website and discover it. 
We don't have any email systems that we can get notifications from. And as an 18 year old, I don't read the four times report. That's not something that I do. And um, you have my address. It's your job as a representation of the constituents of this town to make sure that we have a say and make sure that we know when things are happening that we can discuss. Thank okay, thank you. Yes, I, I, there's oh, someone sorry. else. You, okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm Sandra Larson, 96 Ross Work. We have a simple solution. I drive through Mount Adams every day, and they just put a real estate sign, similar real estate sign. So it's a city council meeting tonight, 7 p.m. It's very simple, very low tech, and everybody who tries to drive in our city, if you have it in every entrance, would see it. Thank mm -hmm. you. Hey, Eric. Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay. Is that yes, okay. yes. Um, hi, my name is Michelle Knight. I live at 21 Woodland Place. And uh, I just wanted to address the council tonight, um, not on uh, the issue that is uh, sensitive, but uh, I do want to share, uh, you probably already know, I hope you are, I hope you already know about the visioning committees and what we've talked about. And when we talk about smart growth along 27, we don't want to look like Highland Heights. And we don't want to look like any, we don't want to look like Coleraine Avenue. When we talk about smart growth, we're talking about multimodal paths, talking about medians, we're talking about road diets, we're talking about bike lanes, we're talking about connecting communities in such a way that people 8 to 80 can enjoy. People on Hollywoods can walk to Tower Park without getting run over. Kids can cross from Woodfield to the YMCA without their lives being in danger. We're talking about making our city on the south end what it is in the middle and maintaining that. It is bucolic. It is the park light setting that we all love to live in. And we don't have to change anything on the south side for economic development. What we need to change on the south end is to bring it more in line with what we have on the north end. We need the park benches. We need the planters. We need the sidewalks. We need the access. And if we're going to create this mecca of this health and wellness trail system that we want, we need to be able to connect NKU with Riverfront Commons. And no way is anyone going to be able to get from that desert of NKU over to Fort Thomas without real regional collaboration. And that's what we're talking about, is you've got to be able to get people on foot, on bike, over here without them risking their lives. And you can't do that today. And that cemetery that's located over on 27 is beautiful. And we all know what Spring Grove is. It's a destination. They hold 5Ks. People walk. It's pleasant. It could be the same here, except you can't get to it, right? And so I think we owe it to our community to just start to think more about what our visioning committees were put together to achieve and understand why we've come up with the solutions, the ideas that we've proposed, OK? We, we really want to work together. And that regional collaboration is so incredibly important. And, I, and guys, when we get down even to the bottom, near the highway, it doesn't mean that we just throw our hands in the air and say it's a wasteland. No, there are children walking from St. Therese down Milk Road, and they have no sidewalks. They have no place to get to those apartments where they live. And as a regional partner in all of this, we need to think about connectivity and not about separating folks. And so I want to leave that with you, and I want you to know that, again, those visioning committees, folks spoke, people put their ideas on paper, and it's really the voice of the city. It's what we want. Thank you Thank very you. much. Yeah. 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 Rick Wagner, 67 Hollywood. Um, I know we're not allowed to talk about that, but I want to share it. No, this if is, this pictures. is U Haul. This is U Haul. And this is how they take care of the property. And you can pass them around. If you look, this was June 13th. Okay? That's how it looked. June 27th, that's how it looked. Finally, July 11th, they just threw the garbage can away then and got rid of it. But that's how they take care of U Haul. And that's what we're afraid it's going to look like the rest of this. You know, the last time we were here, the last meeting, um, we brought up a couple things about traffic, 
Uh, is there any thought more about making them put enough uh, parking spots in that building at the corner to have all their cars and have parking down our street? I said, why don't they tear those houses down and put in a parking lot for their businesses? Have you had any conversations with them about that? Well, I'm not sure what the question is. I mean, we, 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 there were several items that were brought up. We did contact the highway department about the timing on the... It's uh, gotten a little on the, better. ...on the light. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, we're not in a position to demand somebody add more parking beyond their property. Every place limits. I've ever been, you had to have enough parking for your facility. It's depending on how many square feet of occupancy the property has, okay. not how many employees are in the building. Okay. The way I understand right. it. Right. But, That's correct. you know, if you're going to have a business, don't park down five, six houses down my street in front of my house. Yeah. And then, you know, I've been putting my cars, my old truck and my old car, I've been parking them on the street in front. So nobody can block. I couldn't get out of the driveway the last time because they were parked within six inches of both sides of the driveway. And the thing was, the one was an old Chevy Suburban, and you can go down there right now and see it. It originally had Florida plates on it. Now it's got Ohio plates on it. And on the other side, there's a Pennsylvania plates on this other truck. You know, where are they coming from? And you're parked there, and you know, I know they said two feet from the sidewalk. How can I? You know, what do we do there, you know? Yeah. But then, the, and the other thing, this we didn't bring up, but it's happened so many times in the last week. And Mary, you can tell me, how many times have you almost been get hit coming up our street or coming in the street? Because could we put a stop sign on Hill Street so they have to stop before they pull out into traffic? I'm not sure where that is. That's not a, that's not a street, that's a driveway. It's a, all the condos, the, the old apartments behind oh, oh, the old okay. Kyle's building. Out of and uh, they don't have okay. a stop sign. They just come flying right out in front of everybody. Is that private or can we put some? Because they, people on Hill Street can't see because of all the cars. Well, that's true. <laughs> because they let them park all the way to 27. You know, it's, to me, I still think parking should only be allowed on one side of that street. I would talk to you, you know. It's, I, I want to put more time. Spot, but it's too dangerous to have parking on both sides of that street, especially when they're almost to the corner. And somebody about the comes in off of 27, and there's people coming out. Are Where you do you go? There's only one lane. Are you talking about the entire street or the portion at the top of the street? I'd say the whole street. That way, you keep them parked up there. <laughs> they can find someplace else to park instead I mean, of down in front of the residential. That's the rule of council. I mean, we could have our traffic engineers look at restricting parking. Usually it has to do with sight distance issues and that type of thing. Well, especially you come off, of, you know, you're coming out or coming in off of 27 and there's somebody coming out and there's only one lane, where do you go? It's, you know, and between that and the ones flying out of Hill Street, those condos and out of that building, they come out, it may not all be Hill Street, some of it's coming out of their parking lot on our street too. But someone's going to get hurt, and that, that, maybe that's what it'll take. Could you make a resident parking only zone down there? On that street, or is that restricted to <laughs> private? That's, that's but a, is that but residential? A, will the apartments be residential? Well, yeah, if they live those there, people yeah. at least. But you know, maybe if they didn't have, you know, uh, have you been? Have anybody you guys driven down? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a problem. It's yeah. a bad problem. Okay. problem. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> and then, like that big Ken Nyer truck sitting yeah. at the corner, that's really tough when there's cars parked. You get a truck on both sides of it. Yeah, and like I, I said, we come I out drove down after the last time you came to the okay. meeting and looked at it. And, and you seen yeah. where I am? With, I got a telephone pole here, and I got cars parked on both sides of the driveway. And with the big van, I cannot turn to get out of it, it when there's trucks on the other side. Look at I mean, we can look at it, and, and just keep in mind a couple of things <laughs> as we have this discussion. We can have our engineers look at it, and they will evaluate it based on traffic standards and sight distance and so forth. Limiting the parking, first of all. If you, the more parking you take off street, the more demand there's going to be for parking. If people are there, they're going to need to park. So if you eliminate them at the top, they may end up further down the street. To answer your question about resident parking, we've never really employed a resident parking. It's a difficult managing tool for uh, the police department or any agency that we don't have city stickers, we don't have parking stickers. To, to manage who's a resident or not a resident or visiting a resident versus somebody who's 
parking there for a different Maybe reason. we need to go back to city stickers. Um, and, so, <laughs> and make it residents only. I'm just saying and it's businesses difficult to manage them for their public parking spaces on street to who city parks stickers. where. We, we receive complaints periodically about so-and-so parks in front of my house, why don't they park in front of their own house? It's, it's a similar type right. of right. issue. But, but we can look at the standards for site distance and perhaps there's some issues related to that from an engineering standpoint that could address some of the concern at the but time. But there's nothing, the nothing for an apartment building has to provide their people so many parking uh, spots. It, everything in the, every use in the zoning text has requirements for off-street parking, but you have to keep in mind that if those things are already developed under that ordinance, you can't go back and say, well, now you have more cars because you rent to somebody that has six cars, now you have to add parking space. We don't have that latitude as a city to require after the fact somebody to add additional parking spaces on their location. Okay. Well, we will take a look at it and see if there's yeah. something we can come up, some ideas we can come up with to maybe help the situation. Okay. All right. Thank you. Could I, I address one thing? Sure. Hi. I'm Barb Yingling and I'm at 1111 Alexandria Park with that very uh, young lady over there who addressed you earlier. I do look at the recorder. <laughs> uh, she doesn't, but frequently it's very hard to even decipher in the recorder what are the annual budget reporting. I mean, there's this plethora of reporting on that last little section along with the options and so on. I mean, I do kind of look at it, you know, front to back and I didn't see anything like this. So I am late to the party. I also will tell you to delete the email that I sent to you um, earlier today. I'll save it for later because it will become an issue potentially later um, to address. A question I have about process, because I'm learning um, about this process as a result of um, this text ordinance amendment, how, would, how do, how does, what initiates the need for a text ordinance amendment? So we have one here of a language change, basically, or adding a definition, because mm -hmm. I did look at our ordinance and saw all the definitions, which is common in a, in a legal document. So what prompted the need for us to even have well, a resident can come, or a person, an okay. owner, somebody can come to Planning Commission and say, I would like you to consider this amendment. Okay. Um, and Planning Commission can make a decision, we'll air this issue. We'll see if people are in favor or not. Is this a good idea or not? Okay. So uh, the Planning Commission actually uh, schedules the hearing, okay. but it's usually initiated by a request from a citizen. From a citizen, okay. Do you have the actual text, what the definition is? Because I looked online and could find no record online, anyway, of the Planning Commission meeting, what the, who, was, who was there, what the actual text is for tonight. Do we post the minutes? Mm -hmm. or do the plan? We do the council minutes, Just not council. the Planning Commission minutes. Yeah. So I mean, they're up record in the city clerk's office. Yeah. Right, but um, not posted anywhere. Right. I mean, you have to come here and, and look for it. So would well, you we read it? To you, but would you yeah, read it publicly as part of this? Yeah, I mean, if you have an email, scan it on an email yeah. to you. I mean, if we get well, a request, yeah, we'll send it to you. Again, yeah. understanding oh, process. Okay. Sure. So it will become part of the, of the proceedings as a result of tonight's reading. That mm -hmm. document will become part of the council minutes then? Mm -hmm. and yes. Are those posted yes. online? Yes. Yes. So after the fact, we will get to read the text of the... the, the we're we're going to read it out loud. Right, in just a few minutes. Yeah. Right. Okay, so we'll get to hear that. Um, so that was another, just a procedural question I'm kind of trying to, to better understand. And then I guess the question from the Planning Commission side in terms of, or, you know, just your decision making as well. What criteria does the Planning Commission use to determine the appropriateness of that request. So, in other words, I, if I came in and I said, I would like to um, add as a possible definition an adult um, venue in, in Fort Thomas, you know, that I would like to have an, some sort of an adult bar or whatever in Fort Thomas. Mm -hmm. There would be, I guess, my request would initiate that process then what do they do to determine what criteria do they use to determine if that's an appropriate request well they would look at other uses in that zone is it compat is it compatible with the other uses in the zone if you would look at our so zone I thought you said it wasn't about zone no in that zone 
For example, if you have a single family and you want to put an adult bookstore in your house and you want them to do a text amendment saying you can have um, adult bookstores in residential zones, mm -hmm. not at your particular house, but in general, in a residential zone, okay. then they would look at the, um, at the planning and zoning ordinance and they'd say, is this compa compatible with other uses? What do we have envisioned in a planning process for single family residential zones? Do we think of adult bookstore is a good idea? Okay. So then, the the do we, is it on record as to the citizen who who initiated this request? Mm -hmm. It was Bob Heil. It was okay. it was it and, said at public meeting. Okay, and it was as a result, and that would be because he is. I I don't know, and I'm not going to go into that. Well, well, we're I, mean, I guess we're back to specific. You just said that the committee. Okay, so let me back up. So the committee then looked at his request related to his ownership. No. No. Well, you just told me that if I made the request, you'd look at my ownership. But you said you wanted it in your house, and that's specific to your residence. Well, now, he wants this. This is just a text amendment saying I would like, if you want a definition in something, and you want that that use in that zone. Okay. It's so not any general. Commercial, it's any not specific to a property. It's specific to any general commercial zone. Okay. Property. As would be my request in any residential. Correct. Okay, I get that. So, any general commercial zone is what the request has been to allow self storage. And I don't want to get into all this right. again. Well, I'm not, but I'm. But that's what we're looking for, right? Self storage definition. <laughs> Correct. In any general commercial zone in the city. Correct. That was the request. That's the request. Yes. Correct. And that's what you'll be voting on tonight. No. Yeah. All right. That, you'll be reading first, second, and then voting. That is August. the issue, yes. Okay. So that would mean that somebody in the Midway District that takes general commercial could potentially, if you if this is read and approved, could put a Midway. Well there's there's four there's four other there's four locations in the community, but the Midway is not a good example because it's a central business district. A different zoning classification. Okay. Because I tried to kind of but see there's, that on there's the map. Four, yeah, the there's GCs four, and there's yeah. four general commercial zoning districts. Okay. It would okay. apply to any one any of those, those general. Four. What are the four? What are the to four? allow that as a permitted use if it's approved as a tax amendment. Then any individual property owner could request it in any one of those zones for that use. And would there let's carry that out to the mm -hmm. next level as long as it's part of the of the definitions and it is a, you know approved for general commercial. Any person within there, you'd be hard pressed to say no to. It's a permitted use. It's a permitted use. It's just like if you're in a single family zone sure. and you want to build a single family right. house. So it's a permitted comes, use. Yeah. So once it's approved in any general commercial, any general commercial owner could then put it in that. It would be required to go through planning and zoning for a development plan for a specific location. But it could yes. hardly be denied. Right. What are the four different locations? Um, I think. Inverness, and Highland, Inverness and Highland Plaza, um, the Fort Thomas Plaza on 27, and the portion in the corridor on 27. Not not both sides, but mm -hmm. portions of that corridor. And then I guess the last question, because not if, if I had been able to read, I wouldn't be asking all these questions, but not having read or attended the, the yeah, planning meeting. Did they look at, did they do any kind of demographic studies? Of okay, me? we're getting back into that hearing, and we're not going to go You can't there. talk about the hearing at all. Yeah. Okay. But, but just for the record, we did transcribe the hearing, yes. and, and that is a document available in our office, so anybody's welcome to view that yeah. or request a copy of it. Yeah. Yeah. And we would request that through yeah. Melissa, Yeah, you can and do she it through can email that part. even yeah. directly to us before the next reading. And if I understand what Jan is telling us, we use this document to make our decision and our discussion sure. amongst us. And I guess what I'm just asking is, is in that document here, you know, is there We're not going to go into all that. <laughs> Get it and read Sorry. it. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, I'm Tiffany Fever, 26 Hawthorne, and I'd like to know what the process is to reverse the text amendment. So what do we do if we want the text taken out of there? Well, first and of all, I request that today as part of coming to the city council meeting. That's a good question. Okay. The text yeah. amendment has I'm not, not been... I'm not talking a about what... I'm just talking about I would like to, if this gets passed, we'll just say if this gets passed because everybody knows what I'm talking about, 
um, I would like to request, as coming to City Council tonight, a reversal. Uh, I would like to request that that be revisited. So how do I go about that you process? Would approach you approach planning a bill that goes to Congress. Okay. You, you would approach Planning Commission and you would ask for a tax amendment. Okay. I'm asking you for that tonight, but I will. No, it goes to planning. It goes to Planning Commission. Yeah. So, I, but that okay. that. You know, the process, I'm assuming, Jan, and I don't know the answer to this, that the process is not, the legal process isn't necessarily over with the council's decision either. I mean, can you appeal that? Can you, you know, I guess you can litigate anything. You can go to. Anybody can sue anybody at any yeah. time for so anything. You can, it doesn't mean. <laughs> you can go to circuit court <laughs> and challenge the decision. To this point as to what, how, how we voice our opinions as citizens of, long term citizens of Fort Thomas. And I mean, I've lived on that street for 26 years on, Haw on Hawthorne. So I am concerned about the beautification of our city. And I want you to be concerned about it. And I want you to know that if this were in your backyard, would you want it? Okay, we're getting back into the specifics of this case, okay? And we just, we can't do that. I just asked what the process was. No, but I mean, now you're getting. So it, go to the Planning and Zoning Commission and ask for a meeting. Is that the. You would response? ask for a text amendment. Thank if you. you Yes, ma'am. So, um, I'm Martha Coffin, and I'm at 64 Hawthorne, and um, I'm just going to say I taught school here for 16 years, and I'm very proud of all my students and all the hard work, love, and energy I put into their lives. Okay, next thing I'm going to say is it seems like we've kind of missed the boat in getting our voices heard before the planning, the zoning committee, and so now I'm kind of curious as to what the evidence are, because I feel like if I heard you correctly, we cannot submit letters and we cannot speak directly to this specific issue before the council. And so I'm feeling like we could have like a public protest march. Is that something we could do? That we, I, mean, I, I, I do know how to organize it, by the way. <laughs> I, I, because I really feel like there's more people who are very unaware of what's happening and what's, what could possibly happen. And so I feel like for the city to make the best decision, excuse me, I'm getting a little nervous here, but that's all good. That for the city to make the best decision, they need the best information from as many citizens that it will affect as possible, both now and in the future. So I, I need to know, like, what are some of our avenues besides possibly a protest march before the next August meeting? Because I feel like we can't send letters in, those will not be read. Is that what you said? That's correct. Okay. Your, then, the opportunity was on June 20th. I, I know that's not making any of you happy. But, and I'm not inventing that rule. That's the Kentucky... No, Revised statutes that that's telling us how we we process so this. So now that it's passed, we're done. There's nothing else that citizens can. Correct. <laughs> uh, I'm Mary Healy, and hopefully third time will be the charm. I don't think it's any uh, secret here how I feel about things. Let me assure people in this room who feel like I do that there will be another opportunity if and when there is a proposal to change the zoning of two residences on Pike 27 to object to that, and I think we will be far more ready for that at that time. I'm Mary Healy, I live at 110 Hollywood Drive, fine. <laughs> um, so I, I hope that helps people, that this is only to allow a storage facility in Fort Thomas. It's not to allow a specific storage facility in a specific place that will require rezoning. And I believe that does require better notification than the other one does. So we will have a second bite of the apple if City Council doesn't do the right thing the first time. And I will okay, just... Okay, we're back to this okay. case again. <laughs> I, I would like to end with a fact. I am very glad to hear that it sounds like City Council is able and it sounds like willing to read the record because there was a lot of information introduced on the record. I will also say a fact that on March 12, 2000, Timothy McVeigh took ball making equipment from a self storage facility into a U Haul, and we know what happened. So I would like to make sure that City Council is aware of that fact. It's a fact. And I just, that is Thank all you. I'm saying. The actual, the next zoning meeting is actually before we cast a vote. Uh, his application for the zone change on the property in question. I don't want to get specific, but the zoning board meets before our next plan, or our next regular council meeting, actually. 
on the 15th of, I mean, of August is there. Uh, are you saying, Councilman Bowman, that we could ask them to reverse their vote? I don't no. think that can happen, but I, I'm just saying that the next planning and zoning meeting that may be dealing with everybody's concerns will be on the 15th. And we uh, well, if yeah. I'm understanding well, that that's supposed that, to be posted, and I have not seen right. a posting of a recommended well, Let's zone. not all get ahead of okay. ourselves. If okay. there's an application, it will be advertised as required. And we do not, not have an advertised. application. Thank you. Okay. I live very close. I monitor that very closely. Yeah. Right. And please read the recorder, and you'll see all the notices for all of our public <laughs> meetings. <laughs> at this council meeting, Ron, mm -hmm. in did you know about this zoning thing at the last council meeting that we talked about Hollywood and all that stuff? Because I didn't hear anything about it till afterwards. Right. Did we even know about it at that meeting? Did anybody know this about it? This is not it? a Who? zone change. No. This is a text amendment. Yeah. No, I didn't say a zone change. I just said, did anybody know about it at the council meeting that they could have told all of us that were here that this was going to be coming up? This is the council amendment. announced. Because we were here at council, and I things never that are on the agenda for council does night. council does not announce the agenda for planning and zoning. That, that's that's answer your question. Yeah. I mean, we have board of nice adjustment you know. hearings every month. We have planning commission meetings every month. We have design review board meetings every month. We, I mean, they're they're all advertised and posted. It just would have been nice. It's, to it's rare something. that we know. When we're talking yeah. about the south yeah. end and all this. Right. You would have thought someone would have thought hey, they might be interested in this and be able to come to something. I mean, the point you're making is that people used to read the newspaper and see those things, the laws, and caught up with what people right. do these days. It just hasn't. But, you know, understand from our point of view, there's somebody on the other side of this issue, and either side, if we don't follow the legal procedure, has a claim against what city council has done. We have to be very careful about following the law, or we have liability. Yeah. We've been against the law and saying we're having a zoning meeting about... A no, it's a different yeah. question. I'm just saying that that is what the law requires. We have to be very careful and aware of that. Wait, what, which one of our... Would it be labor law relations that would meet to say what might be a more effective way of advertising, and, and should we maybe approach that um, to revisit how, how we make our notices available? I mean, we can, as a matter of we could have committee look at a policy that states other methods beyond I mean we'll meet our legal obligations always and we do right. but we if you want as a matter of policy to have other types of notifications as part of that process it could be referred to committee and you could pass an ordinance that states a policy an internal city policy on how you advertise your public media i started tweeting last month i could tweet <laughs> i learned how to tweet <laughs> i don't do that <laughs> Sorry, it would be a labor violations coming out oh, we could probably yes yeah. all i'd like yeah okay yes sir I, I i just wanted to make a comment to the council about being very careful when you vote on any issue that comes up from the planning commission don't just think about current plans of any sort that might be coming behind it. You make a change that's citywide, it could be something you don't expect. It might not be waiting on, for example, additional properties to be rezoned. If you make these kind of changes, you may find somebody tears down a building and takes advantage of that zoning change where you least expected it. So Thank you. please take that into account. It, it's right. not all about those two properties, which I know I can't talk about. I appreciate your all's time. We, yes. My name is Dawn Hills, and I live at 115 Tremont Avenue, and I'm a 29-year teacher veteran at Woodville Elementary. Very briefly, I'd just like to mention that I think it's very telling that we are building new sidewalks on the north end of town, yet possible theoretical warehouses on the south end of town. There is a difference between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. I have a real concern with how the spirit of the law was handled here. And in fact, I'd be very sad for my fifth graders to have witnessed it. You have maybe 40 people in this audience who would like to voice their concerns and they don't have a mechanism for that. That should be addressed. Thank you.
actually, yeah. I, was, I was just going to say, I am very impressed, not only with everybody being here tonight, and I appreciate it very much, and also I appreciate um, the, the citizens of, you, you guys are, are awesome people, and, and Jan laid out what our restrictions are by law, and you all did a great job of figuring out a way to <laughs> express some opinions <laughs> regardless. And that's impressive. That's very, and everybody's been very cordial about it, and I appreciate that very much. Yes, we have a difficult situation here. Uh, we've had some great ideas on how we can improve the information as it gets out, whether so notices about these things in the future. Again, I appreciate everybody's comments. We will be dealing with the record, and the record, and I'm sure we've all read it. I've read it several times. There's a lot of information in this record from the meeting that is very pertinent information, and <coughs> I feel confident that a lot of the information that we need is within this record for us to be able to not get in trouble. <laughs> so anyway, yes, ma'am. Um, just one final comment again. Um, I have lived at the location 1111 Alexandria Pike for 30 years in October. Um, so you, many of you probably have driven past my house, and. I, you know, people ask, where do you live? I, I used to live next to the Purple House. <laughs> Anybody who knows Kim Owens Plumber um, made that purple, but now it's gray. You know, so I can't use that as a milestone anymore <laughs> uh, or any kind of, of a mark. We kind of jokingly in the South End talk about the South End and South Side as the ghetto end of Fort Thomas. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but that's kind of the joke that once you get past the why, it just isn't the same. You know, my house is valued at $140,000 by the Campbell County PVA. You know, I have 200 something thousand dollars in it. I don't want to pay any more taxes. <laughs> but at the same time... Don't put your own record now. <laughs> at the same time, I hope if I get to sell it, or when I get to sell it, um, it will be worth more than $140,000. Um, there is a property not very far down the road from me that used to be... Um, Segura's chiropractic that has been, I guess, rezoned back into residential, because I would presume it must have been a different zoning, that is gorgeous, um, that has been refurbished, beautified, I mean, it is amazing. That property, I looked on PVA today, the exact replica of that property on Riverside or Riverview Avenue, exact replica, same house, is $100,000 less in value on the PVA than the one on Riverview. <coughs> There's one very similar on Linden, where my sister lives. It's rated at $385,000, same basic house. So we recognize that part of the reason I moved to the South End of Fort Thomas from West Villa, where I lived in a two-family initially, was because I could afford to go there. They are starter homes, they are small cottages, or they're country homes like mine that have a bric-a-brac front porch, my little country home in the city, five minutes from the interstate, all you on the north side have to drive all, all different places and be home from the Reds game in 10 minutes. You know, there are values to that community. And I do have neighbors on 27th, you know. Didn't want to buy that house. I looked everywhere when we bought that house. And drove past it every time I went to IGA. Look at that cute house sitting down there, you know, with the Adirondack chairs on the front porch. You know, finally said I'm going to go look at it even though I had a contract on another house <laughs> because I thought I got to look at that house I love it been there 30 years you know there have been changes to the US 27 quarter going three lanes from four made a huge difference I can sit on my front porch and watch rear-end accidents every day the people waiting to turn left in von Zubin you know happen all the time I was the first one calling 911 before cell phones that was an improvement. It, it changes the speed. People aren't speeding past people. But it is. I, you know, when my, that 18 year old that just spoke to you was, you know, when I was taking her a walk in a stroller one day, you know, and somebody drove past at 35 miles an hour and the, and the grill off of a uh, the top grid of a grill flew off and almost hit us in the stroller, you know, I don't really like to walk on 27 because it's not the safest place, you know. She couldn't go farther than the, than the tree in the yard. So, I mean, it, it is still a community. And I think when someone says to you, you're going to look at a, a language change, a text amendment, that could impact only four parts of our city, and you don't know which four parts those are yet, that scares me. 
as a citizen. We know it's the South End, and we know that's the impetus for the change. So it goes back to why there is OK, like here and there, because of existing zoning language, but not other places. And that kind of then gets to you know, the, the next step, if there's to be one. So I just think, again, you know, you are making a decision, as Tom said, that isn't about two properties or Mr. Hiles, you know, initiation of this, this We're text. We're getting kind of site specific again. Well, yeah. I just well, like, we you just all kind of do this uh, dance we, around we a resident <laughs> who brought up this particular language, the need for the language. You know, so that could manifest itself anywhere in the city that yep. has those current zones. Sure. That's or yes. should someone else change that? But That's I'm going to just reiterate the whole South Side, and I guarantee to you that I will become more involved in finding out what the vision is for the South Side. Because right. um, thank you, That's thank important. you, thank you. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. My name is Carl Hartlitz. I live at Three Beachwood. I've been there for almost 18 years. I've come to council meeting once in the past about this issue, and I'm kind of hoping I didn't know this was going on tonight. The uh, the walk around the reservoir when they closed it up, you guys said you would revisit it. It came up once, and I haven't heard anything about that since. As a matter of fact, I think I talked to a couple people when they were walking around, running for council last time around about revisiting that issue, and they said, yeah, we want to bring that up. We want that to happen. But I've yet to hear any, any information about that. Um, yes. It actually has been discussed. You've heard yes. some conversation about the visioning, and some of these individuals have sat through some of those meetings. Right. It is a, it is a topic in multiple committees of the visioning um, that have had conversation about, you know, what it would take to open that to the public. Um, the city has had informal conversations with the Northern Kentucky Water District. Of mm -hmm. course, that's their facility. Um, we are looking at, um, in that conversation, some possibilities, and they have softened their stance a little bit over time since the, the whole 9-11 yeah. threw up the barriers. Um, and we're pretty optimistic that as we progress through this and look at our transportation plan and our walkability, that that will be addressed. And hopefully there's some common ground with regard to our, our citizens' desire to be able to access it and then being able to allow it and still accomplish the safety aspect. It was really great. I mean, when I first moved in Fort Thomas, that was open, and it was a constant stream of people oh, walking yeah. through our neighborhood and going to that and walking around yeah. that. I mean, it was, it was great. It might be more limited, but it, it might be a possibility. Well, yeah. once, once you open up the gate, maybe more things happen afterwards. Yeah. Um, now this is a this is a separate issue, but it kind of dovetails on to something that Tom brought up. Um, on Robson Avenue, if you're familiar with it, coming off of Grand Avenue, there's a yellow line where people cannot park for a certain distance, but it's not long enough, in my opinion. And I'm asking for your guys' input on this. People come flying up Grand Avenue, and you're trying to get on to Robson, and there's traffic that's parked so close to that edge getting off of Grand Avenue into that area is too congested for somebody coming down that hillside at the same time without a possible conflict right there. Okay. I'm asking that that yellow line be extended. Extend a little bit further. Yeah, we can certainly, okay. we'll certainly have an evaluation. And the sure. last thing I've got is who can I get clarification on a city ordinance relative to sewage? I asked Mr. Barbian, he talked to me over the phone and said it's a civil issue. and it. There's clear information in the ordinance, but it doesn't say whose responsibility and how they go about enforcing. Are you talking sanitary or storm? Sanitation. Okay. Um, I, I can get a little bit specific. I mean, there's three properties starting one line, and a line goes through another person's property ultimately after they're all joined. And one of the owners that's part of the three <coughs> thinks that the person whose property is going through where the leak is. It's their responsibility to take care of it, which I think okay. is a totally <laughs> okay. ridiculous. I, I didn't catch your last name. I got your address. Herklotz, three beaches. I'm, I'm sorry. Herklotz, B-T-R-K-L-O-T-Z. Okay. Let me check with Kevin, and we'll reach out to you to Yeah, because I, I found the ordinance that covers that, but it doesn't it doesn't lay clear liability on who the property <coughs> owner is that's responsible for fixing said uh, violation. I'll, I'll review with Kevin and, and okay. Pierre and or I'll be able to. I appreciate it. Sure. Great. Thank, Thank you very much. much.
All right. Thank you all again very much. We should get into the discussion. I would, I mean, going back to the advertising issue, I, I really would like to see that addressed, and I'd, I'd like to make a motion that I guess labor law and license review uh, the issue and, and make a recommendation as to what could be done to change our, our minimum method and, and make it a little more effective. Second. I second. Any further discussion? Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to add to that. I mean, here's some reaction about people that have used the, the website or the lack of information on there. We, we, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a tech kind of person, but I, we really ought to. If, if there's room for improvement, that's the place to start. It's not just, you know, a legal requirement. It really is what makes information more available and what gets people more involved. I mean, we really ought to. I, there's some good stuff out there. If, if, and maybe it is good. I, I don't know. Yeah, but, but, but maybe. I think, yeah. I think, we, I think it's worth some decent investment. And, you know, really, it really is true that with, with more input from citizens, we get, we make better decisions. There's no doubt about that. The problem is that people, you know, unless it's something very specific to them, you don't, we don't get that input. It, what we need is for people to just get generally more engaged in things. And, that, and, and, and people really are four times as great like that. I mean, if you all haven't been involved, some, it sounds like some of you are involved in the vision process. Uh, it, it, there are a lot of engaged people, but there's, there, there are never too many. And so I really encourage you to, even if it's not a specific thing to property in your area, that the more input, the better decisions are made. Me. Yes, ma'am. As part of that suggestion, if you do build something on the website, have the ability for us to sign up so that we get the notices automatically. That's what and I think. Yeah. We'll be more engaged yeah. with what you're saying, yeah. as well as then when they're, you know, whether we want to be more engaged or if something is specific to us, we'll know. And I would say to communicate back, too. Yes. I mean, you know, electronically. So you don't have to we, come to a meeting. We we made like a this. we made a real effort a couple of years ago, and we used the um, college informatics at NKU help us totally redo our website. And the website actually was done by a police officer for the longest time, and was great as far as getting information out there um, because he was a real tech oriented. It did an awesome job for us. College informatics helped us redesign the website. A lot of this stuff. I think we kind of created and then it just kind of fell in the cracks and, yeah, and we didn't utilize all of the aspects of what we could do. And, and part of it's just getting ourselves acquainted with how do we do this and make sure that we stay on top of it to get that information out there. Just real quick about the Campbell County Recorder, you know, I've noticed, I'm practically a lifelong resident here, um, I've noticed that the recorder has articles in it that are way past time, you know, no, they are not timely. I see the same article on Fort Thomas Matters or somehow online way in advance of what appears in print. Also, my recorder doesn't always land on my lawn because volunteers, you know, children, bring it along all along my neighborhood. And that, <laughs> uh, yeah, he's not mine. I wasn't. <laughs> but seriously, it is interesting that our, our, uh, point of record or whatever is a newspaper that's distributed by children on a voluntary basis and can't necessarily be counted on to receive in a timely manner and the print in it is out of date. I would be most curious to see the actual issue, the recorder issue that had this notification in it because I'm not real sure if it was in the right timely dated it, it absolutely format. was we have proof you know, of publication i understand what you're saying but we have proof of publication and yes they're dated articles but our pub are required i are mean they're they're it, the statute you're talking about a statutory requirement right. that we have to meet and we do meet it has to appear seven days prior not more than 21 days in a publication it's required to be that publication I've been here for over 30 years. When we first started, it's like, why can't we advertise in the Enquirer back then? Right. Because everybody gets the Enquirer. Nope, they qualify by <laughs> statute. It's where we're required to put it. And they are in there, even though maybe the articles are dated. Yeah. If you look at those, they're all published under the terms of the statute so this for all the cities. On, if this meeting was on June 20th, this the meeting mm -hmm. we all missed, ever missed the 
When was that advertised? Seven days prior to June 20th? At least seven days, not more than 21 days. Okay. And it's considered a Thursday publication. Right. So it would not have been the week immediately so it's prior. It would have one been one time in one, in one Thursday. Right. It would be issue. because they meet on Wednesdays. It wouldn't have been in the Thursday prior. It would have been the Thursday before that. And and actually, a lot of times that delays a lot of what you know. People are so excited about how fast stuff happens in government. That's one perfect example. It publishes on a Thursday. Somebody comes and makes a request. If they don't make the request in the sure. right time that you can get it in on that Thursday, it'll be seven days ahead of time. Well, yeah. you're next month. Sure. So we have developers coming to towns like up in the up in the fort, you know, where oh well we missed the deadline for that newspaper to make this request. So now we're delayed an entire month just because of one day because of that recorder issue. Okay. And and there was legislation that was introduced in part for that reason it yeah. just slows you know, the I whole do process that. Yeah. i do get yeah. that yeah. but, I, but I, my issue is that i don't always get to record on my lawn right. in a timely manner yeah. yeah. and there are dated articles but i completely can see where those announcements have to by the law appear at the right time yeah. um so moral of the story is when that appeared when that was in the newspaper what did it say it, it's it's a notice of a hearing. It states the hearing date, time, location. And again, those are all statutory requirements. The time of the meeting, the location of the meeting. But it said there would be a hearing about of a text such amendment. And such property, about what? It would t do the topic and the location. If, it, if there is a location. Okay. Got so it would talk about the Planning Commission's public hearing, this date, this time, this topic. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, obviously, we appreciate the motion to do something. It to was seconded for so now. <laughs> yeah. Let me let, let, hang on. Let me finish out this motion. So we the, any further discussion from council? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, roll call, please. Mr. Cameron. Aye. Mr. Bowman. Aye. Mr. Beasel. Aye. Mr. Beerman. Aye. Mr. Slaughter. Aye. Okay, that's good. Yes. Sure. Um, tonight, I was excited to bring my daughters. Oh, yeah. They skipped swim practice. Okay. Yeah. And I encourage my kids, let's go and figure out how government works in our community. Uh oh. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I do want to give you a compliment because if you've had, if you've, I didn't realize we had so much hand time, but I feel like you guys have been respectful to listen to our hearts and our concerns. Um, and while they may be disappointed to not see Leslie Nope up there, um, I think that there is some encouragement that we can, maybe we'll see a different story for them. Thank you. I know I asked them before, I said, if there's anything that you guys would want to say, like, you love the bike path idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, our, you know, my compliments to you because young people need to be, I mean, that's a great way to bring up your kids. I mean, this is, this, this idea of government is how our society collectively is supposed to make decisions and make progress. People need to be engaged in it. I think that's a great lesson. Thank well, you. Well, and it's going to be exciting for them to see what happens since they've heard the issue that we're not talking about tonight. Talking about. <laughs> 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 it's going to be exciting because we live at 66 Hawthorne. And my name is Laura Lewis. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I think I should make a statement that I, I grew up on the south side. I grew up on Riverview. <laughs> and really I, the south side. I moved off of Riverview when I got married, and I bought a house back on Riverview after I was married. So Good. We don't I live on Sheridan, so <laughs> I live on the, not south the worst side as well. <laughs> yes. I wasn't going to open my big mouth, but here it goes. I'm Bonita. I live on Bonnie Lane. It's where I was raised, born, bred, the whole bit on the other side of the tracks. Not the slums, but the other side of the tracks. South side. Um, there are parts of Fort Thomas that are considered the south side, and I did jokingly with the gentleman that was with um, Mr. Howell the other uh, last meeting, I joked with him at, outside and said, well, Mr. I live in the park, south side. He can't speak from our standpoint because he does live in a park, and he's not seen okay we're back to a specific no, applicant no, no i i'm saying as the as the council looks at fort thomas as a whole please look at it as a whole one thing the other day i went down hollywood's drive knew hollywood's drive well growing up because i had some playmates that i used to go to school with lived down there i was in shock at 
the front, and this wasn't during when uh, RWI would have been working and that kind of stuff. This was later. Both sides, it looked tacky. I, I thought, oh my gosh, is this what Hollywood's Drive has turned into? As I got past the initial scare at the beginning, then I saw, oh, this is closer to what I remember Hollywood's Drive being. But I just wanted to put my two cents in as I was shocked with that, the whole aesthetics of that, the parking, the cars, the, the block. I mean, I, I, one poor resident couldn't even get past because I was coming up and I mean, there was just nowhere to go and it was just, just the whole feel of it, it was so tacky. So if anybody were to just accidentally turn down Hollywood, they, they would get out of there as fast as possible because it would scare them the way it looked. It was horrible. So I just want to put that in. South side, please keep in mind that we do want, I am on the visioning committees, but I, I'm not on many. I accidentally became part of the visioning co committee. The website, um, when it comes to the city meetings and that kind of stuff, it's on there, but then I had to figure, okay, which Wednesday, Monday, is this the third Tuesday of the fourth month of the, it, it is not clear. On the Cam Campbell County Recorder, when I came back to Fort Thomas, um, I started, I got a Campbell County Recorder. The only one I got was the one that had a bill in it that said, I'm going to be coming around and collecting on this. Now, when I cut down my bush bushes, I found several Campbell County Recorders back in behind my bushes and that kind of stuff. On top of it, there were times I found them on the hoods of my vehicle that had been sitting there because I didn't go to that part of the driveway. And I have a very short little driveway, <laughs> but I didn't see the things. And there they are baking in the sun, rain soaked on the hood of my car and that kind of stuff. So I didn't realize that the Campbell County Recorder was something that that's what I need to be reading. I do not see any Camel County recorders. When I got the one with the bill, I try to communicate with anyone, please. I try to communicate with the person who was collecting the money. I try to call Camel County recorder. I tried emailing who, what, when, or where. What do I need? I need some details about the Camel County recorder. So I see not one single Camel County recorder anymore unless I went and pulled it out of the old bushes that I had. <laughs> but I, I mean, I really don't get it. So I didn't know that that's where I need to be going for pertinent data. Please, on, on the website, if there's some way, like the sign posted that on the 19th, we're gonna have a city council meeting. On, on the 20th, we're gonna have a planning commission meeting. I, for one, am curious, because I've never been really involved in stuff unless it is specifically to a certain person on the street type thing, I wouldn't have known about a lot of this. Mm -hmm. So um, I try, I'm trying so desperately to communicate with people I know. Go down there, see what's going on, because we really, after the fact, when everybody starts complaining, the city council allowed this to happen, no, the city council didn't. I will say to you guys, you've been very approachable, and I love that. We, as citizens, all of us, need to address meetings and visioning committees and that kind of stuff. And yeah, I know a lot of people have very busy lives and schedules, but we, as citizens of this community, one day we're going to wake up and we're going to find out there's things that we don't want. So kind of all of us, as a community, need to get that word out to everybody. Your life is important, yes, and you are busy, yes, but this is our community and this is what's happening to us. So there's my big mouth. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Sorry. I'm keeping short. So I wasn't really planning on addressing anybody today, but um, I feel like I'm probably one of the only ones that have it. So I'll... Um, Name and address, please. Uh, Lori Deal, 119 Hollywoods Drive. Okay. Um, I am a relatively recent resident of Fort Thomas. I've been here for about a year and a half. Um, Michelle Knight spoke earlier about the vision for uh, the 27 corridor. I absolutely believe in that. Mm -hmm. 
wide streets, slow, slow moving, park benches, bike paths. I have a two year old. Sorry. That's the poor Thomas I thought I was moving to. And that's all. Just, I just want to make sure that the text amendments that we make and the decisions that follow that are in alignment with our vision. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, again, thank you all very much. We will move on with, um, uh, well, at this point, we, we're discussing the text amendment. It's the first reading. We can have further discussion on this amongst council based on the information that we received from the planning committee. Um, if anybody would like to start anything on this. We want to have a reading? One. I mean, you have to do that. It's, is it, you, you want to have the reading now or wait till it's on the agenda? Uh, either way, we can move ahead. Like and, yeah, let's let's go ahead and, and read that, or let's read the ordinance, and then we'll have discussion on. Uh, this is a summary of ordinance 020 2018 an ordinance amending the text of the official zoning ordinance of the city of Fort Thomas, Kentucky, to include self storage facility as a listed permitted use in a general commercial zoning district under Article 10 Zen Reg Regulations, Section 10.12, General Commercial Zone, Subsection A, Uses Permitted and Amending the Text of Article 7, Definition, Section 7, by adding a definition for self-storage facility. The Planning Commission has forwarded its recommendation to City Council for approval of two text amendments to the official zoning ordinance. One amendment would add self-storage facility to the definition section, and one amendment would list self-storage facility as a permitted use in a general commercial zone. City Council adopted the two text amendments. That would be but if we pass it. it. Okay. Text. <clears throat> All right, so that is the first reading, and I'll open the floor for discussion. I was in attendance at that meeting, and so I feel like I could speak to the issue if anybody has any amongst us uh, questions about what transpired at the meeting. Um, I was there. Uh, I don't know what level of detail we want to go into, but there was quite a there was a, an impressive attendance at that meeting as well, and there were two no votes, so it was not a unanimous slam dunk thing. So. <coughs> That being the case, it probably could use some more scrutiny from our body. That would be my well, Ken. One one thing that jumped out at me was the how narrow the definition is. And then I, in reading the record, I couldn't quite pick up the conversation that led to the wording that we see here. This the definition that we see here is pretty specific to the proposal that was presented by the applicant. Um, so I would assume that should the text amendment become part of the new ordinance, anybody that wanted to do that in another GC zone would probably be having to either conform to the way his was initially proposed or I guess go to Board of Adjustment to ask for a variation on their particular application. Or another text amendment. Well, no. No, we wouldn't go to Board of Adjustment. Or would they go? The, I mean, the language... Typically with a text amendment, an individual that makes the request works with staff on the actual proposed language to fit it into the, you know, the required sections that would accommodate the request. And they work with the staff on the actual language. So the language that's presented is what would be voted on and was voted on by planning and zoning. And so there's no variation to that. It would become a matter of law if it's approved in the text and a text amendment is the only way that you would change it. So, so this language would apply to any applicant for any self-storage structure in a general commercial zone if this language existed in this zoning ordinance. Okay, yeah, the language in this actual ordinance does reference some of the specific plans as such as the definition that would include our, our 
require inside entrances to the units as opposed to outside. That's specific to the applicant's plan. And so that language ended up in this ordinance. And so I would think anybody that <coughs> wanted to deviate from that would then have to go to planning and zoning or? Yes, it would require a text amendment. Okay. No. So anytime you create a definition um, for any use or violation or any aspect of the zoning ordinance, that definition <coughs> helps guide the enforcement or application of that for our zoning administrator. And that would become the text that would serve for that purpose. Right. Any deviation from that would require that the ordinance be changed Modified through the same again. process. Text amendment. Correct. Can, can you speak? So during the committee meeting, were other peer cities addressed how they deal with this issue? Um, so for instance, you know, Fort Mitchell, right, for Maramont, Rose Park, like these are pure cities, was that dressed the, the, the only, uh, To the best of my rec uh, recollection, the only um, example that was given as a, a uh, storage facility within a residential confine was downtown Cincinnati, which is a totally different animal. Um, and that's, that's going deeper into this, like, big picture. That's a lot of my concern, too, just as you just now did. We frequently, as a body of government, when there's when there's an issue that needs to be discussed or hammered out, we always say, "Well, does this happen anywhere else? You know, let's see what a, what a, where this you know if this has happened in another city." And um, and so, should we move forward and should the approval be given? Theoretically, Fort Mitchell could have the same issue. Uh, you know, Terrace Park, whoever, another applicant, and then we're a pretty respected source and they could say, well, they did it in Fort Thomas. You know, so a bigger picture. Um, you know, there's broader implications to our decision, I think. Jane, you, you said something earlier about uh, the question was asked, how, what, what factors are taken into consideration when these, when a language or an addition, additional, I guess, use would be taken into consideration? And looking through all the other uses, they all look like either storefronts or shops or something along those lines and this this actual number 68 kind of sticks out to me is, is not lining up with the rest of those was, was that was that talked about there in that meeting or how, how does that no, they, they, it was talked about during the meeting in the context that while there's already 60 whatever five permitted uses you could have a liquor store you could have a bar um, as if to justify adding one more use um, but I don't think that there's anything in the permitted uses now. I'd have to review it to be sure, but I don't think there's anything that would be of that scale. Well, I'm, I'm not talking about scale, I'm talking about use. And it, it, I would say Some, a very large percentage of these are all shops or storefronts mm -hmm. or some type of, I mean, dry cleaning laundry, mm -hmm. that's that's considered a shop, but th this, this kind of sticks out to me as not being Consistent in line with, with the rest of them. I agree. But I didn't know if that was brought up during the meeting or not. Well, if there, these numbers are not, these pages are not numbered, but again, if you look at your transcript, um, on the third last page, one of the commission members um, made the comment, as the definition is in the text amendment, I think it is compatible with the other uses or even less, even less of an issue than a lot of the other uses in the general commercial zone. I would rather see this van an automotive repair store or a packaged liquor store and line I, I'm I think this might have been a misprint on, and line store I'm not sure what that is that's why I think it's actually less intense use than a lot of what's in the general commercial zone already so it was so that, that, that was that's just kind of reflecting somebody's that was thoughts Jane, yeah. one of the you know I mean, sort of a too. point of order here so you know we have to make a record of what we say because they could appeal that either side could appeal that wouldn't it be better to just have this discussion when we're going to vote on it, you could rather than have further discussion now. I, I, you know, then it's all in you know one place, one set of minutes. I mean, we've already had some discussion. I don't know if this is recorded, but this gets, you know, just all complicated all over the place. It makes it more difficult for people to deal with if we, you know, don't really follow the procedure. That well, and also the, the transcript um, is being proofed because you know the person who transcribed it was not an employee of the city. Yeah. So now one of the employees of the city who was at the meeting is listening to the tape and this to make sure there are no type of So it's not final. So it is I hope that gets out because there's a ton 
of errors in here and yeah. miss And so them. I suggested that they go through not to change it other than what was actually, you know, reflect what was actually said at that meeting. Okay. So um, to your point, Roger, it may make sense to wait till you have the final um, draft to have the discussion. Yeah. Do we expect that? <coughs> I wonder she was working on it today. Okay, and it'll go out. I think that in itself would give us a good reason to hold back because there's a lot of inaudible in here where they couldn't understand what was saying. I think the general gist is here. I think the information is very helpful in, in reading through this, but I, I see your point, Roger, and in, in this is just the first reading. We can get the better transcript and then have a discussion at the next meeting uh, and get into more detail about it, if that's okay with Everybody on the there was also, I think, a petition presented at that that was not included in this. Wasn't there a petition that was... The yeah. Planning Commission, can, uh, Julie Rice can send you a copy. Uh, there was a letter introduced, but it was also read, so that right. it's actually read yeah, that's here. In here. But the then letter. there is a petition that can also be given to you. Yes. Yeah. That should probably be included as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I need to speak off the record, and pardon me, but... My husband was there. I was under the impression, since it was mentioned that there were two against it, I thought it lost by two votes. So, uh, uh, lost by one vote. So, Councilman um, Bowman, you were there. I would have thought there would have been three no votes. I was not there, but I thought it only lost by one vote. There were, was that an eight person? There were two no's. I know there were two no's, and everybody else was a yes. Five yeses, two no's. Five yeses. There's seven on the I'm yes. sorry, I, I, I was misinformed. Okay. We will move on with our agenda. You all are welcome to stay. Just so we understand, will the next reading occur on the 20th of August? The right. next. That is the next council meeting, and that's when it will be brought to the floor, yes. But also, there is a planning and zoning meeting on August 15th. 15th. Well, Again, but <laughs> there, please understand that the agenda oh, for the you might want to check in the office for the agenda. I I don't know what's on the agenda yet for, for that. It, it may, so we're allowed to put on the agenda the Planning and Zoning Commission that we'd like this not to be added. Correct? Is that a fair statement? You're, it's a public meeting. You can address that commission. However, it, if you're interested in a specific topic, it may or may not be on that agenda. Right, but I can get it on the agenda? Get, I'm sorry, get what on the agenda? <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can go to planning commission meeting and you can make a request. Now whether it's timely or appropriate or, you know, that will be determined by the planning commission at that time. Okay. But it's an open meeting, it's a public okay. meeting, anybody okay. can come. Okay. If you want to call the office, we can, okay. we can talk to you about how, how the agenda is established and when. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Is there a place I can look to see how the planning commission is appointed? They're not elected. They're not elected, no. no. So we're giving our feedback, they're not elected. Okay, thank you. No, but we can tell you. They're, they're appointed by the mayor or they're, they're appointed. appointed by the council? Who, me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's how things work. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand the process. Don't, don't we know that? Don't we? They're appointed, I, well, sure. yes. They're appointed by who? The mayor. The mayor. Okay. Well, not with council consent or anything. <laughs> no, they are with council consent. With council consent. They're by, they're by municipal order. Okay. Dan, so we, uh, you don't have to look it up. bring up the subject. You think? Or well, planning commission. This is out of their hands. This text amendment is okay. out of their hands. They're finished with it. They've made their recommendation. They're not going to take any more action on it. No recommendation unless we appeal yes. it, right? Well, you you wouldn't appeal well, it to. Well, them. you can't appeal something they haven't done. I mean, it has. It's it in a it's a process. Okay. Well, yeah, we're all to reverse it even faster than it gets through. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you're not going to be able to do, you're not going to, if you want to call me, we can talk about all the procedural things about okay. their actions. They are warning us that the next proposal for a rezoning of residential property may be before that. So, so I would mark your calendar. We don't know that it's <laughs> All we're saying is the next council meeting is August 20th. And oh, by the way, there might be a planning and zoning meeting on the 15th. Don't know what might be on that agenda, but you can call the city to find out, because I doubt that we'll have all our super great internet web announcement <laughs> stuff done by then. But we're going to work on it. 
So again, thank you all and very much. And if there's a public meeting, it will be in your recorder. Yes. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> we're going to move ahead with the agenda. You're welcome to stay or you can leave. Thank you all so much. Uh, we are down to reports of officers. Um, fire Department monthly report. Chief Bailey. Thank you, Mayor Haas and members of council. Uh, I really don't have anything to add to the monthly report that was mailed out in your packets, but would be glad to field any questions. Does anybody have any questions have. for the chief? No, sir. All right. To receive and file. Uh, excellent. Is there a second? Second. Roll call. Mr. Cameron? Aye. Mr. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Beasley? Aye. Mr. Peterman? Aye. Mr. Slaughter? Aye. Excellent. Thank Police you, Department report. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to report that July 4th went extremely smoothly this year, and that's always a combined effort with police, fire, public works, and all city employees. It went very smoothly. It was very hot that day, but everybody made it work. And as far as our monthly report goes, I'll answer questions. All right. Any questions? Yes. Move to receive the call. Second. Roll we'll call. Mr. Cameron? Aye. Mr. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Beasel? Aye. Mr. Peterman? Aye. Mr. Sullivan? Aye. All right. City Administrator's report. Okay, to receive and <laughs> <laughs> Okay, fair enough. <laughs> I was going to bring up one thing to the, his report to say that all we did was band-aids and ice packs, but I, I don't want it. Oh, good. <laughs> good. That's all we did. Good yeah. job, Casey. Um, I'll just update on a couple of items. Um, just one that is of good news to note was um, we did apply for historic preservation tax credits for the armory and mess hall and we did receive those nice. um, in the amount of fifty four thousand three hundred one dollars and ninety cents that will be reimbursable to those projects and they set up they're setting up this week so they're starting on those projects this week so that's good news um, an update on Alexander Circle. We met with the developer. We had an actual closing. For those that maybe have or have not seen it, um, the city actually no longer officially owns title to those, although we're integrated with them. We own title to the portions outside the homes themselves that will become part of the park. Um, the important things there is they are progressing um, immediately. We had kind of a, a pre-development, pre-construction meeting that their construction individuals we're going to have a meeting on site with our safety departments um, so everybody becomes acclimated to who's on the site and who's permitted on the site. They're intending to have kind of a public announcement of kind of the closure of that space. Unfortunately, if, uh, somebody mentioned about the walking around the, uh, this gentleman. Um, everybody likes to walk around the homes up there as well and it will be closed off for public access when they get started and they're very conscious of how important it is to the community, but they do have to close it off. It's becoming a construction site. Um, so there'll be a number of hazards. They will start with site development, which is all the utility work in first phase. They will start with new roofs on all the structures immediately, and they will do all the asbestos removal in all of the structures. And then they will do a rehab of five of the selected units in their first phase. Um, so that's how they're proceeding. Five, five units or buildings? Five units. units. At, at the outset, <coughs> yes. Um, will that remain public walking area? It will on? after it's completed, okay. yes. Yes. So years. And in fact, um, <laughs> the, it, just to identify the area, the, the grass area out in the middle is all becomes part of Tower Park. Um, so, so you'll be doing something with the middle of that too, possibly? Um, well, it'll be passive, but there, I think the right. intention is that it'll be developed with some walkways and an overlook. You'll be able to access the, the area overlooking the river. Um, there's an intention to work with the Forest Conservancy to cut all the non-native, which will create a better view. We're not cutting yeah. trees, but it'll take all that other nasty wow. stuff out of there. <laughs> and you'll actually be able to see the river from that area. But it'll have, it'll have public access, and it'll be a public right-of-way but it will not loop around the ball field anymore. It'll be two-way traffic in and out. Yeah, okay. So, um, so a that's- Any environmental surprises or anything? You know, that, that's all- We hope not. No, no, no. <laughs> not yet. I mean, nothing well, like that. Let's just say we spent a lot of time <laughs> on that topic with the VA before the purchase. So yeah, there's so. not any, and we actually did late testing for the lead contaminant in the soil and there was no okay. ratings beyond alerting ratings that would require additional work beyond what was already in the scope. So hopefully not. Um, 
the North Fort Thomas Avenue sidewalk, and I understand council has received some input, and this kind of goes to the messaging thing, and um, you know, that has been part of our conversation with some of our visioning is messaging from the city, communication with our residents. We'll certainly bring up some of those topics when we do the Law Labor License Committee meeting for council. Um, but we've had, uh, obviously that project was announced with a grant. Um, just to update where we are, we, and, and you all know this, but we did, and, we, and we're going to hopefully have some, some uh, articles that, that maybe speak to this issue so our public understands this. But we did have um, a selection process for our engineer, as you know. Um, they are on board, they are doing work, even though it's not obvious in the field. Um, they're doing design work um, for construction bid drawings for that sidewalk. There's a, there's a lot of required um, thresholds for the grant application in order to receive those monies. Um, we have to do a study and do the easement acquisition as part of that upfront process. And those things are all taking place. Our time schedule is to do construction on that project in early spring. It will be bid this year. Um, but the other thing, and this is a late development, is um, we coordinate with all of our utility companies and we have alerted the water district as to the number of water main breaks that have occurred there. And their uh, evaluation has resulted in their need to replace the main on North Fort Thomas Avenue. So they have started put that. Where? Um, from covert out to the corporation limit yeah. is my understanding. And somebody's yeah. painting all that today. So <laughs> okay. the same side of the street or the sidewalk. It hasn't been designed yet. They've put it out for uh, design bid. Um, so it is on the street to solicit their engineer. And the intention is that that project would be let out prior, obviously, to us doing our work. But the existing main that's going to be replaced, you know, which side of the street do not. That's all. It depends on the location of all the other utilities. So when they get but their engineer <coughs> to design it, they'll choose where. It really doesn't in. matter because all the all the connections are, would be interfering with our sidewalk anyway. Right. So right. that all has to be done before the sidewalk. Right. But the the messaging there is it is on schedule. It, and I know it was announced earlier, but due to meeting all those requirements and now with the water main, it is it is scheduled for us to do our work in next year. When we do this, a design and have a design available, we'll have a public meeting for our residents. Do we know? And that will occur in the fall. Do we know that if, if the necessary easements have been obtained? They, or no. The, some have, some have not. No. Yeah. The, uh, there, if you touch any individual's property, they have to have a construction easement right. in advance. So all those have to be identified after you do the design if the before design you know first. how much you're going to affect the <coughs> So those those are in sequence. But even with this water thing, you you think it can be done next spring? It, yes, um, it's our understanding that the water district has approved this project in their budget in this fiscal year. Okay. So their intention is to to let it out for a project um, bid after it's designed this fall for construction of the winter. So. He is saying yes. spring, so that gives us a little <laughs> bit more time. Yeah. Spring, summer. We don't have control over their schedule. We only tell them what our schedule is and that they have to be before <coughs> us. So, um, and they're aware of our requirements. So, um, so we're, we may do an update and, and try to get a mailing out. But again, it's difficult to know who all has interest in it. And when you start doing direct mailings, you can, you can do the people that have frontage on that affected construction site. And that's really the extent of what we'll do. Um, Moving forward, just a couple of other items. The street program, of course, is Pentland, and that also has the water main. If you've been by there, the <coughs> detour signs are up. They've saw cut for the water main is the first part, and they'll be working in there this week. Um, and unfortunately, that you know that will get us into October <coughs> probably before that project's complete. The Moyer streetscape we talked about at the last meeting. We got actually got good bids on the light post. We're working now currently on the crosswalk at that location. Um, so you'll see that completed prior to the school um, school year starting in the next three weeks. Um, and then uh, I noted a couple of retirements. Um, and obviously we have some retirement parties for our retiring police chief, um, Chief Daly. 
and that one is on July 31st, and and then firefighter paramedic Matt Stewart is retiring, and his retirement party is on August 3rd. Um, we have it in this room, and the public's invited, or any employees or employees <coughs> wish them well in their retirements. Um, the visioning schedule that you heard people discussing, um, we will be posting a schedule on the website for that. Um, the, the committee meeting, the committees may meet one more time um, with final um, drafts of their particular um, committee. Um, but we'll, we will be going through the required um, comprehensive plan update. So there will be a goals and objective public hearing that goes to planning and zoning. Um, and we'll probably set a special meeting for them to consider those because, because that is required as a formal adoption to meet statute. At that same meeting, we'll probably do a working meeting with the Planning Commission to update them of the draft of the plan. And then there'll be a public presentation of the plan in total, um, which will probably be a joint meeting of Planning and Zoning and, and this Commission um, uh, Council. And the only other thing Joe had to cut out early, but we uh, have contracted with PayCor and we did our payroll through PayCor um, and all of our employees got paid this pay period so, <laughs> it, worked. so it worked um, first time Did they, get paid the right amount? they got paid the right <laughs> amount I'm not going to say there weren't glitches but they will be worked out and it will be uh, of great benefit and and quite frankly there as you know the with modern technology there's so many opportunities there that will assist that process and our employees and everything is direct deposit and they'll be able to access all their records individually so it's, it's a very good move, and we were very encouraged with the first time through. So. And the 4th of July was great, and we heard from the safety departments, and there were no issues, and thank everybody for participating. We need so more candy. More candy. <laughs> more candy. More candy. More candy. All right. Is that it? Did you say that when would be is going to be done in October? It, it is being initiated now, just so uh, <coughs> clear, there's a water main that'll take place first, and it'll take about five or six weeks to be done with that. Immediately behind that will be our street contractor, and that will probably take an additional six to eight weeks. So, so it'll be completed sometime in October, it's on schedule at this point. So how does that impact kids coming out of our neighborhood? Can they still walk on that land to get um, to The sidewalks will be open on one side or the other all the time, yes. Okay. Yeah. It will be a complete reconstruction of the pavement, but not right. the sidewalks. If my kid's on the pavement, he deserves to get stuck in the ass. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't put that in a minute. So no. no. <laughs> okay. Is that it? That's it. Great. Does Thank anybody you. have any questions? That's it. All right. Um, new business consideration agreement with uh, FDISD for school resource office. What FD Fort Thomas, Fort Thomas, Thomas Independent, Independent school, school District? Well, we are very happy, and uh, when I say we, we have spent some time at a staff level working with the school district, and I will ask Casey to join in this conversation as well um, through our police department. Um, I, and, and I will also add that this agreement, although it's written between um, the city and the Fort Thomas Independent School District, it also includes the school resource officer being a participant in the parochial schools within our city as well. Uh, but the agreement is specific to the working relationship between the other two. Um, and I will just preface it and, and certainly ask Casey to join in. Um, and obviously, we're no different than anywhere else in our country. We've had a lot of issues with, um, you know, the topic of school safety. Um, the school officials and the city officials have been in conversation over a period of time, um, dating back a couple of years on this topic. Um, but um, working with those individuals and with our police department, um, we have determined that we have an opportunity to create um, a school resource officer position within our police department and that it will involve one of our officers basically being assigned to the schools during the workday during the calendar year of the school and they will rotate and be engaged in with their administration of each school location they will rotate on site they'll be based out of the high school um, and they will have their workday centered around 
student safety, school safety, and the locations within our community where our students are during the day. Um, if you recall, we have a traffic officer assignment that was specific to traffic. Um, this is really not different in that we are taking one of our um, officers and basically making their primary responsibility centered around schools and school safety, um, working with the individuals on site at all those locations. Um, and what you have before you this evening is um, a request. The school is actually considering the same agreement at their meeting this evening um, that basically outlines um, the working relationship between our officer and the school and, and how they will conduct um, their affairs when they're acting in this role. So um, the request is for approval of the mayor to sign off on the agreement. Um, at this point, it is, I don't want to say it's, um, it's a test in, uh, year, but in reality, the first year you do anything is kind of a test year. Um, we had some conversation about financial responsibility and participation, and we really felt like at this point it was um, financially possible to utilize our staff the way they're currently and uh, number-wise and just have an assignment in this capacity at this time. Um, but we've had conversation about how that might be shared in the future if um, we feel like this program is worthwhile and we decide to continue it into the future. So um, this would be uh, an agreement for one year, one school year. Um, the dates are specific in the agreement. Um, so that's kind of where we are. And Casey, please, if you want to add anything. Well, I think you covered it very well, but I would just add that, you know, we have been approached by several different stakeho stakeholders throughout the city asking, you know, why don't we have an SRO position right now? And I, I think that the timing is right, with the exception of the retirement of Chief Daly, we're fully staffed. So it's a, it's a position that we have several officers capable of doing, and we're, we're fully staffed to the point where we can do it with an in-house officer without creating too much stress in our department. I think we're getting the timing right by doing it for this coming school year. Excellent. Um, I apologize for the lateness, but it was a work in progress. So you all have kind of seen it late, but... Um, in, in the, the draft is borrowed, it's borrowed language that they presented to us and Jan's reviewed it and we've, we've made sure that it represents our interest um, to the level that, that is necessary. Um, would the SRO visit more than one school in the course of one day or would it be one day here? One well, day Mr. Here? Bowman, we, we would anticipate that he rotates amongst the seven schools, which would be the, the five independents and the two, two parochials. The schedule as to how often he spends at each school would be up to him and each principal. You know, one school may need him for something specific every Thursday at 10, whereas another school may say, we need you here all morning on Monday. So that'll be incumbent on the police officer to figure that out the first couple of months. And he's going to be flexible, and we're going to be flexible to make it work. But he hopefully will make it around to each of the seven schools on a, on a weekly basis. And, you know, down the road, if one of our preschools calls and says, hey, can you send our SRO over to teach a class, we'd be open to that, too. So, but he, he would be stationed, have an office at the high school? Correct. Yes, sir. So what if some non-school incident occurs and he's needed, he or she is needed for that incident? Do, do they leave just like they would for a normal police incident? Certainly if there was some type of emergency and he heard it on his radio, he would, he would go. We would okay. expect him to okay. be reasonable. He's got a car. Yeah, yeah. Certainly. Yeah. He'll have a car. Of being a full police uniform, it's to me, it's really just putting a police officer in the school system okay. on a full time basis. There's no different, he's not any less of a police officer just because he's there, it just happens to be where he's going to spend his whole day. Now, is day there special day. training? There is, and yeah. he actually started his today. It's a okay. 40 hour through uh, the Department of Criminal Justice training, which is what we all have to do mandated by KRS. And you have somebody in mind already? We, we've, we've talked about who we're doing, yeah. I mean, you can. We is. picked Officer Zach Rolfer um, okay. after an internal process with four candidates. He was he's been with us for a long time and he's spent a lot of time in the school already. So he was the right choice. But he started his training today. That's great. Right. Um, just a very technical thing. You've got an odd date in here starting June twenty. Uh, it seems it should just be July one. So it runs with the budget. Here. There's some, you know. Well, they are actually, um, 
it's August 6th, which is a week prior. That's when the teachers and staff are when the schools starts with their people. So they'll be uh, about a week and a half ahead of the students, and they'll be in each school meeting with their uh, staff and interacting with them oh, at each location. Here. And then it goes through a week past their last school day. So that's when they and then he'll be here. returned back to regular duty after the school year is over. But the contract itself is a one-year contract, and one I'm just school saying year. one calendar. Year. Oh, one, one school yeah, calendar. One calendar year. Year. Yeah, one school calendar year. School calendar yes. year. So it's actually less than a year. Right. Okay, correct. Count you. So he'll be expected to be on regular assignment after school is completed in June. For the okay. Of that. okay. Then I, um, I guess the only other thing is so it has this indemnity language in there, and. Um, do we, is there a special rider we need for that, or is that just covered by our general liability? It would be covered under our general liability. So we don't yes, have they're to. Still, they're still yeah. an employee of the city acting as yeah. a police officer. They, okay. they just, their assignment's just specific. But we are indemnifying the school district. <clears throat> to the extent provided by law, which is. Okay. Uh, yeah, and yeah. I don't know. <laughs> the fact that insurance is in there doesn't make any difference on it, I guess, does it? Okay, oh, God, really. So they can't identify us? That's what I would almost ask for, right? No. No? We can't do that. What's that? Identification with by governments isn't permitted. Well, we are identifying them. So well, we add to the extent things. permitted by law, law. which is. We can't indemnify them. <laughs> okay, that's, that's pretty standard. I Most that, people so. want that, like, want the indemnification clause in their contracts. Right. But we can't do it. Can't do it so right. what they let us put in there is to the extent provided by law. Okay. <laughs> Which is not. <laughs> it's out. not. I love it. You lawyers talk together. You know what you're doing. That's so that's what you learn in law school. That's what they teach you. <laughs> Does need action? Yes. Yes. It would be authorizing the mayor to sign. Move approval. approval. Uh, any further discussion? Roll call vote, Great please. Idea. Mr. Cameron? Aye. Mr. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Beasel? Aye. Mr. Peterman? Aye. Mr. Slaughter? Aye. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Finance Committee report on disbursements. Report of disbursements June 16, 2018 through July 13, 2018. General Fund $420,459.97. Power Park Fund $1,495.17. Public Works KDOT Fund $4,782.26 Reoccurring Debt Service Fund $1,140.88 CBD Revitalization $130.31 Waste Fees $90,283.05 <coughs> Police and Fire Pension Fund $1,481.57 Total $519,773.21 we, the undersigned members of the Finance Committee, recommend that warrants numbered 4038 through 4176 be approved and the treasurer be authorized to issue checks for their payment. Mr. Peterman, Chairperson, Mr. Beasel, member. Move to concur. Second. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Cameron? Aye. Mr. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Beasel? Aye. Mr. Peterman? Aye. Mr. Slot? Aye. Awesome. Okay, ordinance resolutions and orders. We've already done the first one. The second one, 021-2018. This is a summary of ordinance number 021-2018, an ordinance amending ordinance 019-2018 by establishing the annual salary for the position of chief of police. The annual salary of the chief of police is $95,330.34. For the 2018-2019 fiscal year, commencing on August 1st, 2018. That's the first reading. Um, now, Municipal Order 05-2018. Municipal Order MO05-2018, a Municipal Order of Casey Kilgore is Police Chief for the City of Fort Thomas, Campbell County, Kentucky, and fixing his compensation for the fiscal year 2018-2019. Entertain a motion for that one. Is there a second? Is there a second? Any That's discussion? Hmm? There was a second down there somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Any discussion? 
you guys sure you really want to yeah, have him? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's do a call vote then, just to be sure. Mr. Cameron. Aye. Mr. Bowman. Aye. Mr. Beagle. Aye. <laughs> Mr. Peterman. Well, this is a procedural question. We already received and filed a report made by Chief Kilgore. Yeah, I know this guy. Acting Chief. Acting Chief. The time trail. Okay, I'll just vote aye. <laughs> Let the lawyers figure it out. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Thank Congratulations. You. That's sir. awesome. That's awesome. Welcome aboard. Officially. 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 Okay. Uh, is that it? That's all we have? That's uh, we are adjourned. Thank you all very much. For your first meeting, you sure didn't bring us luck on time. Yeah, well done. <laughs> Congratulations.